Hello, everybody, and welcome to podcast number 41 of 2019. Hello, our Cruise Society podcast, Thrive, Pedro Dig Un. My name is Mr. Gareth Evans. I'm joined today by Mr. Henry Toxic Sludge Nuke Cooper, right? Um, yeah, I thought you were just going to leave it as toxic. <laughs> toxic <laughs> Cooper. To we just had a discussion yeah. around some... Death stranding s- things. Spoilers, maybe? I don't know. No, I don't, I wouldn't t- tough tough it shit. You should have played it by now. Have you not got 60 hours spare to cane a game like that in like 10 days? God, I think I am about 50, 55 hours in now. Still not finished. Dude. Don't know where the end is. It, it's not at the point where the end is in sight. You've got too many distractions now. You've got Star Wars. Exactly, got- and I've been trying to neglect star wars I've been like trying I've been your best to neglect these games like leaving him alone like right look i know where it's, i know where your, i stand it's your girlfriend that he's neglecting henry come on well Get she's, with the she's been grumpy this week so it's been eating into my game time as well because <laughs> i've been trying not to make her even oh more my God. and i made her watch star wars i was right about it being yeah but mandalorian i was no right spoilers, about her no begrudging yeah because the whole fucking internet spoiled it for me see spoiler. star wars official twitter spoiler spoil it or did me. they because it's not officially available in the uk so you've got to do let's move let's move on let's, let's move on before anybody <laughs> gets twitchy um we got we've changed changed it a little bit a little refresh for the podcast this week just to keep things a little bit fresh um what we're going to do we're going to start off with the news that you missed this week we're going to th- jump through at quite a rapid pace some of the news that happened this week we weren't able to cover in in our content for one reason or another because there's just so much news and there's only so much work we can do sometimes um, it's just too small to do a whole video on so there's no yeah. point so we're going to jump through uh, maybe seven or eight topics i think we've got um we're after that we're going to go to community suggested topics now this is a new feature I asked the community, patron community this week what they want us to discuss in the podcast, and we're going to go through um, a bunch of them. After that, we're going to take the questions, as usual, from the community over on Patreon. And then we're going to look at the top YouTube comments from this week, including the triggered fanboy comment of the week, everybody's favorite segment. Um, so let's move on to our first story. This is the main story from this week. You can't get away from it. Every single outlet was covered covering this. Uh, Google Stadia's launch mishap. I don't want to say disaster because that's just overused. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not mishap. quite a disaster. It's not, yeah, it's like not good. Fall in the, in the, fa- on the face when in you're the running mud. across the field and you got all your shit on and he just kind of goes <laughs> and doesn't quite fall over. Stadia um, fails at Death Stranding walk uh, is the yeah, headline. Yeah. <laughs> Stay, so Stadia launched, and there was a few a few issues, to say the least. They said originally that there were going to be 12 games at launch. Um, uh, this is a bit of a backstory. Uh, it was just like a week ago, just over a week ago, they said there was going to be 12 games at launch. People were disappointed, and Yong Ye made a video saying it was dead on arrival. Um, so they added 10 more games. So uh, uh, I mean, thanks, yeah. Yong. He's got a lot of <laughs> sway. He's got a million subs now. He's, yeah. He's important. Uh, I, I sometimes wonder how much truth is in that how much actual yeah. Yeah, how much they, they're, they're looking at um, influence like Young because he's the biggest one now who covers the controversial topics let's say if he does a video like totally slating something dead on arrival it said on the thumbnail yeah. <laughs> because there was 10 uh, 12 games um, and they were like oh shit there are games that you to. still have to buy it's not yeah. 12 games free with mm. the, the package you still got to buy them on top so there you go problem solved thanks young stadia was saved time to crack open a cold one not quite um, because for many people the founders edition of the game the people who paid for the founders edition didn't arrive at launch um so many people's hardware didn't arrive they spent 130 dollars supporting this product at launch and they didn't even get to play it so you were meant to launch. get you, you have three months of subscription a, a controller oh, we're, 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 a chromecast yeah. we're getting yeah, into that was supposed to arrive at, at, on yeah. day one but it didn't arrive it um, means to play the thing you've just paid for <laughs> and thanks to metal shark from the community for pointing out this next fact when the Founders Edition was sold, the website even said the Founders Edition comes with a guarantee. That word was used. A guarantee of access to Stadia at launch. Um, I really hope they come out and address this and do a, a Randy Pitchford. It's like, yeah, we said no microtransactions, but that's not what we actually <laughs> meant. <laughs> You're the idiot here. I, 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 can't, I can't believe they didn't get it into people's hands at launch. People were waiting to... 
uh, the next day or the day after just to get the well, yeah, what was promised like the controller yeah. the Chromecast everything you pay all, all this money for a, a service you don't know anything about you, you su- you're supporting this concept this yeah. this thing that works in it's theory speculative purchase and, and they then, don't even get it to you well eventually that stuff presumably will arrive but the one thing it that won't started. be arriving at least for a little while is the uh, the body pass isn't it oh there's i'm about to go yeah, through everything else more okay good we're getting there henry <laughs> hold your horses sir even if you did manage to get it on launch day or you've gotten it since there's still a bunch of features yeah, we're missing go. from launch which were promised in the founders edition to those purchases and i'm going to run through these now the 4k hdr and 5.1 surround sound is only available on chromecast ultra for now which is the one that comes with the past all the other chromecasts if you've got another old chromecast you should have a look stadia controller only works wirelessly with the chromecast ultra got any other chromecast you should have a look <laughs> voice assistant features on the chromecast ultra is limited at launch the three month buddy pass which henry just mentioned will not be in the launch package it's coming in a couple of weeks so again you should have a look <laughs> multiplayer features such as stream connect state share and crowd play which they promised won't be available at launch so you should have a look achievement system is not is not it that not there it won't be implemented until next year so again you're shit out of luck family sharing which lets you share purchased games with other accounts is coming next year of course it is because we're all shit out of luck <laughs> at this point if you want a, a a game for a family member you got to buy, buy them separately they said just buy them separately that's that's your solution thanks google in the lead up to christmas when people are going to be <laughs> buying a lot of games okay we've got four more at launch the only only the Chromecast Ultra shipped with the Founders slash Premier Edition can run Stadia. Existing Chromecast will not not until a firmware update is rolled out <laughs> shortly after launch day. So all your other Chromecasts, they don't work. But oh, sorry, I've got an Ultra. I already own an Ultra. No, no, Shit. no. That one doesn't work because it doesn't have the hardware. There's the software on there. Shit out of luck. Purchasing games must be done through the Google Stadia mobile app. You can't buy them on the web browser. Uh, you can't uh, direct purchase them through the Chromecast either um, so you must have uh, a mobile app to purchase games Google Pixel, fo- Google Pixel phones are said to be the only mobile devices to support Stadia this year uh, <laughs> Chrome OS tablets can run Stadia too so anything else you shit out of luck free games are planned for the future although there is no schedule yet if you're looking for free games apart from Destiny which is part of the subscription uh, you shit out of luck isn't Destiny going free to play soon anyway or is it already? For, oh, I think I read somewhere that, that yeah, that's the future for the the thing. I don't know. I haven't got anything in front of me, but it might be. So there you go. Um, people they they shafted the people who supported them basically with with this lack of features uh, as well as lack of getting them into the hands on day one. Even if the people got it day one, the critical reception says that this thing just doesn't really work that well. Kotaku called it, said it. It just ain't it, was the headline. That ain't it, Chief. Just ain't it. Jason Schreier called it a monumental flop. Paul Tassi of Forbes couldn't get it to work in his house, despite great internet speeds. Otherwise, IGN's Kevin Lee saw graphical artifacts and frame rate stutters even at a 200 megabytes per second home internet speed. VentureBeat reported that Stadia uses over 7 gigabytes of internet data per hour that you play at 1080p. 4K will be even more than that. That is... It, the, the, <laughs> the, you, I mean, you, you could put it on the box as like a, a promotional thing, like the world isn't ready for Stadia, the impact Stadia is going to have on all. No, the world isn't ready for Stadia because the internet infrastructure is not there and it doesn't work. It doesn't It doesn't work. There's, there's, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things, right? So with all that said, that's just a, a brief snapshot. There was one guy who said it worked fine. Uh, I can't remember who he was, but he said it worked fine at his coffee shop in at home or whatever. One guy can get it to work. Woo! I, know, I mean, well, well done, what, Google. What does fine mean? Does he say, <laughs> did he say fine or did he say exactly. good? Or yeah, like- exactly, exactly. We don't know. We don't know this stage. Um, so long short of it, many people uh, aren't happy, weren't happy still. Yeah, as you can imagine, there's a lot of upset. Then Yong Ye made another couple of videos because, you know, why make one video when you can make three? Uh, yep. And that's where we are as of the time of recording. Uh, there's no been no further updates. Google haven't tried to haven't done anything yet. Um, 
so that's where we are. So in summary, let's kind of go over in case you weren't paying attention. Uh, there's hardly any games, there's hardly any features, and it hardly even fucking works. Welcome ag- aboard, Google. You'll fit right into this modern gaming industry. That, that is true. In, in, <laughs> in a world where you're telling people streaming is the future and, and you need to convince people, I don't think you've done a great job. You, <laughs> you needed go. to hit the ground running with this, but you've just... Hit the ground. <laughs> just hit the ground just face the first, ground. essentially. So that was Google Stadia. Also this week, let's move on to some other topics. Well, we'll bang through these really quick. So there's quite a few, but they're, there's, they're not not huge worth elaborating on, elaborating on for hours and hours. Sure. But Anthem is apparently getting a huge overhaul, which, I mean, th- apparently there's life in the old dog yet. Yeah. They're sticking with it. They're sticking yeah. with it. Uh, I mean, they're they're, they're c- committed to the future of Anthem is what they keep saying that's the quote the PR people keep throwing out you would hope so um, so this is according to Kotaku's sneaky little sources they love their sources uh, yeah apparently Bioware are planning huge overhaul for Anthem but they're not entirely sure what that could be it could be a series of individual updates in the same vein as No Man's Sky just slowly over time keep putting new things in or it could be an extensive expansion like Destiny 2's uh, The Taken King which came out recently or um, what's the other one Forsaken was that yeah. that yeah that's the recent one Or it could be an entirely new game, like an Anthem 2.0, not a full sequel, just like a semi-reboot type Mm. thing. But they don't really know what they're planning to do with it. Yeah, there's no announcement yet. This is just sources, right? Yeah, sources. And and even his sources are even then unsure. It's like, we've been told we're going to do this, but we don't have plans on how we're going to do this. Right. So it's still very early stage, I would say, then, even if it is happening. And all I can think is maybe if they were given the time and the resources and a decent engine, they wouldn't have to do this now. They could have done it in the first place. Yeah, they could have done it in the first place. And I was saying that along for Anthem. Uh, one would wonder, one would hope that they don't charge anything additional yeah. for any any future content because they've got to fulfill the the promise, or the, the, the money's worth of what the people who bought it exactly. in the first place. And quickly touching on the engine there, Bioware's former general manager, Aaron Flynn, has criticized the engine. And there's a series of articles and different quotes and stuff, but one I, th- I think summarizes it quite nicely is, my experience with it was very much like this. You could do amazing things, go very fast in some elements, but very delicate and very hard to manage. So that sounds pretty much along the lines of what everyone said that it makes really pretty games look really nice and it's really great for first person shooters but if you try and do anything outside of that um mold yeah. then it's just gonna break and everything will cascade down like a like a house of cards it's perfect for shallow games that are just marketed on visuals much like ea want out yeah. of games it's perfect for ea's um what ea want out of, a, of an engine what gamers want is like a full in-depth game with lots of features and stuff that work together well lots of systems uh, and that's just not it for it's just not it it's just not it why don't ea license it out to people like uh quantic dream who do their um like narrative driven very cinematic yeah arguably should just be a movie did you become human yeah did you become humans or your heavy brains or what just make them really really pretty because they made their own they yeah, made yeah, their true. own engine did uh, uh, and Concept Dream, and it's you know yeah. speaks for <laughs> itself really it was it was awesome that being said with EA and Frostbite uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order was made in Unreal Engine and yeah. it's the best game since oh it's certainly the best, best EA game yeah, for since a they while. took it in what, best EA game since Tankfall 2 which again was, was a respawn on, game. yeah respawn yeah <laughs> Uh, oh, anyway, man. oh, best game since Apex, best game since Titanfall Two. All those games are, are yeah, Apex was on Unreal as well, wasn't it? I I, think. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway, I don't. We, we don't. Know. One of the only ones waving the flag. Correct us if you're wrong. Right, moving on to the next topic this week. Animal Crossing. You might not give a fuck, but um, the Animal Crossing Pocket Camp is adding a d- more monetization. Now, a na- Nintendo announced that an Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Yeah, that mobile game from a couple of years ago that everyone got pissed off about leaf tickets or whatever the the uh, monetization or uh, fake real money in the game was. Um, it's now getting a two tiered subscription model. So oh, your choices Christ. of subscription for Pocket. Let me remind you what this game is: Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Okay, subscribe. You can subscribe now for seven dollars ninety nine. You get the cookie and De- depot depot plan cookie and depot plan give subscribers five free fortune cookies the mobile games loot boxes amazing uh, per month plus plus an expanded inventory 
So you're paying to gamble. Paying for features, yeah. And paying for gameplay features. And meanwhile, the $2.99 Happy Helper Plan, doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> <laughs> that automate it, what, what that'll give you is it'll automate some of the in-game tasks such as collecting event items and completing animal requests so players get this won't have to log in as often you pay money to, to play, play less, less. <laughs> that makes so much sense <laughs> oh. so uh, animal crossing is a nintendo owned brand right it's it's they own the ip they publish it and everything yeah yeah i believe so and this is just another example of nintendo taking what is a very popular franchise i do not care about animal crossing personally it's not the sort of game i enjoy so i don't play it good for you if you like it. it's just not my thing but it's another example of them taking one of these big franchises that have a lot of love and have this Ringing family friendly yeah family friendly vibe and then ruin it for everyone specifically the people who have been playing the games the fans themselves they brought a subs- um, subscription into wasn't mario kart as yeah well? mario kart where you, you and the the take a ride on the pipe <laughs> it was the quote from the Lakitu's like, oh, what better way to finish a race with a spin on the pipe or a hit of the pipe? Oh, yeah. You know? And then, awesome. then a character shoots out. So this new monetization model is on top of the recent addition, which we mentioned, loot boxes, which came into the game in April. Eurogamer was especially pissed off with this news and ran with the headline, Pocket Camp's latest event epitomizes its slow slide into greed, with Tom Phillips of the outlet saying, as I've reported before, these boxes presented in-game as fortune cookies, they taste sweet, don't they? They taste nice, like you want to break them open and stick them in your mouth. They're an awful addition, designed to give duplicates, have low chances of rare items, be incredibly expensive at nearly three pounds a pop. Way to go, Nintendo. Way to milk those parents' credit cards. I mean, yeah, that, that's it. They're targeting the... Uh, the ig- I don't mean ignorant as in, like, deliberately ignorant, but pa- naive parents who have just... Okay, that's a game. There you go, kid. Be quiet for five minutes while I have some peace. And then it's just... Oh, let's open all these cookies. They, they introduce three-pound loot box or fortune cookies, um, whatever earlier in the year so that they can throw this subscription out at a more reasonable uh, yeah, $8 yeah. Uh, playing the hero for five, five, eight dollars $8 for five we yeah. can buy one for three I mean that's up to you but I'm just saying it makes more sense you're practically making money you're practically <laughs> making money we're giving it away we're <laughs> losing money on this deal wow <laughs> Jesus Christ well after that Nintendo fiasco there's another one which we did cover a- earlier in the week but we'll give you a quick uh Quick, quick recap, reminder, yeah, recap, and there's a little bit of new information. So this one is about Pokemon. So Pokemon Sword and Shield launched, uh, I think it was earlier this week, or was it on Friday? It might have been on Friday. Uh, critical consensus Friday. was pre- pretty positive. Most people quite liked it as being like, oh, it's good Pokemon fun. Other people were like, yeah, it's done nothing new, and it's, it's the same Pokemon it's always been. But a lot of fans are really upset due to a number of issues, including... Uh, an incomplete Pokedex, which is a very controversial decision. Uh, it being glitchy, it being overpriced, because it's essentially the same as just a 3DS one in terms of mechanics and complexity. If anything, this one's even easier, but it's full price because it's on the Switch. And there's been no significant innovation, people complaining about like the Gigantamax thing where the Pokemon goes go really, really big. That's like the only thing. Um, and reuse character models from uh, Pokemon Let's Go and I think another one, but I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pokemon were said to be left out to free up system resources. That's what Game Freak came out and said, uh, so that they could make better graphics and better performance altogether. But that doesn't seem to have been the case because the game still doesn't run very well and still looks kind of garbage. Yeah. <laughs> so that meant that uh, the the hashtag Game Freak lied was trending on Twitter. But then before long, things got out of hand and people completely nullified their arguments by sending death threats to the developers, which is never good and is fucking disgusting action, if you ask me, which led to a counter hashtag, thank you, Game Freak, of people being uh, overly positive about the game. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of the other major issues is that the claims about uh, all all the Pokemon are going to be built from the ground up, which meant that they were reusing the other models because that was the lie that they're being accused of. Mm -hmm. Apparently that was a translation error made by IGN in their in-house translation and other people from different outlets picked up on Mm -hmm. it, but no one really knows the answer. I don't speak Japanese. I don't know. But the most recent development is that modders have been doing what modders do and fixing the problems that developers cause, and they've been adding in the Pokemon that are missing themselves. 
doing God's work essentially and it, it's not that extensive but uh, they're, rele- they're at least in the Pokedex I don't know if they're actually playable yet but they're uh, managing to just copy over the just like <laughs> Game Freak did yeah. copy over the Let's Go <laughs> versions because wow. um, I think there's one, well, the one in the shell Omistar I think it's called it's like a crustacean shell thing. Mm-hmm. Copy that straight over and give it a little profile in the Pokedex. Don't know if it's a playable, you know, yeah. usable Pokemon, but it's there. Completing the uh, completing the set, I completing mean, the Dex. There you go. After Dexit. After Dexit and Dexit all. means Dexit. <laughs> with Dexit looming, how are you gonna are you, are you gonna catch them all? How are you gonna catch them all with when they're all not there? I don't know. Moving on. Uh, the that was one video we covered this week, and if you want to go and catch up with the full thing, uh, it was Monday's video. Activision's Bobby Cocktick was the subject of our Wednesday video about um, Activision. Basically, he was generally generally being his normal, usual, out of touch knobhead self, uh, the triple AAA CEO we all know and love him to be. <laughs> um, speaking at a public event about how mobile is the focus, focus of the company in future, with a view to achieving one billion customers within the next ten years. Um, so we did, like I said, we covered that in depth on Wednesday's video. Go and check that out if you want some some more some Bobby Kotick memes. I mean, it's always good. He's so easy to, to bully when it comes out <laughs> with dumb shit. Uh, then there was a huge announcement from Valve this week, if you missed it. Um, a new Half-Life game was announced. Yes, yes, a new Half-Life game. No, no, Not don't Half-Life 3. get <laughs> too excited. It, it wasn't Half-Life 3. Uh, they announced their new Half-Life game. Unfortunately for most fans, it's just a VR game. It's just a VR game. I'm a fan of VR, so I'll, I'll be interested. Um, but it seems like they decided to use the popularity of their most beloved franchise to try and promote their new um, VR hardware, the Valve Index, which they released this year. I They're mean, bringing out a new um, hardware towards the end of the year as well. It uh, is a smart move, but it will shift more copies of the It's a business thing. move. Yeah, it makes it's sense. A move for the company, not a move for the fans, you could yeah. argue. Yeah, but it, I think, if anything, this means that there is at least a little bit of life in the Half-Life um, yeah. brand. A little, a little bit of Half-Life. Bit. Life. Yeah, a, a little bit of Half-Life. 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 <laughs> half a Half-Life. There's a quarter life. Half of a life. I, I'm surprised. I mean, just, just to tie up the info, Half-Life Alex, as it's called, arriving in March 2020. I'm a little bit intrigued as to why there's not been more backlash about this, right? Right? Because if you think about a well-established, well-beloved brand franchise being announced for a different gaming platform it's got echoes of the Diablo and Morton thing right yeah kind of and as an exclusive thing like you can't play it on you know, a normal system without a VR you can't yeah. just play it as like an FPS I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like I don't know where I don't know whether they've missed the outrage or what, but I'm a little bit like, where is the outrage? Where do people stand? Uh, people were so pissed off with Diablo yeah. Immortal coming to mobile, a new Diablo game, and it's not a, a a a mainline entry that we can play on our PCs. What the hell are you doing? You know, is, yeah. is this an April Fool's joke or whatever they were saying? <laughs> but this time, I've not seen anything. It's like Half Life. They're bringing a Half Life. They're putting all these resources into a VR game so they can promote their hardware. I'm I'm a bit like. Well, there's a bit of a double standard. Where's the toxicity? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on, gamers, we've got, we've got faith in you here. Where is the toxicity? Yeah. It wasn't. It didn't. It didn't. Lo and behold, it might be uh, due in future. Yeah. But uh, I'm just left scratching my head over this yeah. one. I'm, I'm. I'm. I was expecting a different reaction. But I feel like some people were already so. Uh, like given up on Half-Life so they just don't give a shit it's like yeah Half-Life 3 is never happening Half-Life's dead oh look Half-Life VR couldn't give less of a fuck or there are people who are so desperate for anything Half-Life mm. that they're, they're snapping this up and it's like it doesn't matter if it's a different thing it's more Half-Life and that's what I want and people just love love Valve and they love they, to they, back Steam yeah. you know they just love yeah, that company there will I mean, be some people who back it because it's Valve and therefore it's against Epic <laughs> there you go Um. so I think next to last, oh, we've got a, c- a couple more. Um, we also got this week the Game Award nominees were announced. Now, this is the sixth annual Game Awards, which will be happening this year on December the 13th. And it's brought to you by Jeff Keighley, Doritos, and Mountain Dew. That Those last two were a bit of a joke there. <laughs> Me- uh, however, Metro is reporting that the event already seems destined for controversy as the nine nominations for Death Stranding are the most of any game. Now, 
this is important because Ke- Jeff Keighley, the guy who created and runs the Game Awards, is obviously best mates with Kojima and even appeared in that game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's 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 something. So say say what you will. Um, Metro obviously have their opinion. Um, so uh, Death Stranding has nine nominations more than any other game. Yeah, there are some uh, categories which I can understand it being in. Like it, it's one of the nominees for Game of the Year. It won't be my Game of the Year, but I yeah. can see that a lot of people would consider it to be that. However, it's also nominated for um, Best Action action Adventure Game. There's a separate category for just action, but the Best Action Adventure Game, uh, and the the, the descriptor for that is for the best action slash adventure combining combat, okay, just let that hang, with traversal and puzzle solving. Um, Death Stranding... I really like it. I like it a lot. It's got really interesting traversal, which you have to engage with. You have to make sure you're doing it right, which makes for quite a compelling game loop. If you can get behind that, a lot of people can't. But the action sucks. Yep. It's got... Because that's not what it is. It's not supposed to be like an action-heavy game. It's not really trying to be. It's just kind of there as a means to fight monsters and people with back uh, trying to steal your packages and shit. Game Award nominated for, among other things, best combat in the game yeah, like what do you do among the other nominees mm. are uh, Borderlands 3 Control Resident Evil 2 Legend of Zelda Link, Link's Awakening and Sekiro Shadows Die Twice all makes of sense. which yeah they make sense Actually, they are action adventure games there you go but then a game like um, uh, Days Gone which is massively action adventure I mean pretty much every Sony first party is action adventure just Death Stranding is the more adventure than action there you go um, so with those nine nominations, like I said, Death Stranding leads the way. Control was nominated for eight, which is uh, a result, and Sekiro has five, so Sekiro comes in third place. So the Game of the Year award uh, consists of Control, Death Stranded, Sekiro, Resident Evil 2, The Outer Worlds, and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which released in December, but because of the cutoff yeah. of the Game Awards, is included in this year's. Yeah, just like Jedi Fallen Order isn't included in this year's because it missed, 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 the, the, missed the window. Yeah, I mean, I uh, Death Stranding being nominated for so many awards, it's it's kind of bullshit. But Death Stranding, Control, and what's the other Sekiro? They're the most highly nominated. They're all brand new IPs, mm-hmm. which I think is amazing for yeah. um for the industry. That's that's a great sign. Just their placement is perhaps questionable. What would you pick out of these game of the years? I don't know if you've played all of I, them. I mean, I've played Sekiro. I've not played Control or Death Stranding. I mean, Outer Worlds is my favorite game of the year. Um, but like I said, yeah. I'm, I have not experienced uh, all of them. I know Death Stranding will win it. Yeah, that's that's quite likely. I think Sekiro might take it because a lot of people are like the Dark Souls yeah, fandom, and the, a lot of the lo- the like active gamers, if you want, like you know, the loudest voices will be yeah. uh, Sekiro fans. Out of those games, I would say Resident Evil Two. I've been saying that for quite a while just because it's a game that, that it was exactly what I wanted it to be and then more. Control, that one I don't think deserves to be there because of the state of it on um, PS4. Consoles, yeah. yeah I just, the- well, to be fair... It is good, but... Thankfully, Jeff Keighley may have nominated the games. He does not have the final say because it's... Yeah. <laughs> uh, There's it's, a full committee of... It's like 30-odd like international journalists and, and, uh, and influencers and, and whatnot. Whatever. Um, they're going to decide which one wins. There's some serious snubs for me. In uh, Days Gone altogether, it should be there more. I don't, I don't know if it's actually nominated for anything. I think it's in there somewhere. Uh, but Days Gone and A Plague Tale should both be in there for music and score because they've both got amazing scores. And then a game like Devil May Cry 5, a game I love, a game that does have great music, but it's basically three songs, and they're your the, your battle songs for the different uh, characters. Yeah. That, that's, I, th- 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 that, that's not good enough for me, mm-hmm. personally. Uh, but then uh, day, Days Gone on Playtale absolutely should have been there. Sam Witwer, not nominated for, again, from Days Gone, for Best Performance, I yeah. think, is a total miss. Anyone from Days Gone could have been there, like Boozer or... Mm. Um, Who's the guy? Uh, Carlos. Any any of those guys. Yeah. So, but hey, I'll I'll sit here c- cuddling days gone by myself. I'll make him feel feel better. There you go. And t- I think it's like how many categories were there? 
there was like 20 odd categories and six of those categories were for esports uh, incidentally enough and one for content creator of the year which makes seven non-specific game related although more like industry things but re- realized how important esports and 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 stuff yeah. was best esports team best esports coach best esports caster sports caster yeah <laughs> best esports fucking What's energy that? drink best esports headset i i, I don't know, i mean i'm making these up now it's probably yeah. what they'll be yeah. in a couple of years but um, well, there's there a lot of you know, your expected genres, like your best fighting game, your fresh, best fresh indie game, brought to you by Subway because it's fresh, right? I mean, I, I, I get it, but um, the one I kind of expected to see is um, like a best studio, like because yeah. th- there's a community one which is generally multiplayer games who are like uh, Apex or Destiny or whatever, but I kind of uh, the studio with a whole shooting mentality and stuff I would have expected to see because a, a company like Capcom for me would probably deserve that from having done Resident Evil 2 Devil May Cry 5 and Monster Hunter Iceborne uh, expansion all three massive massive hits and a huge return to form for the company that's been garbage for a long time well that, that, that's just me there you go so that's the Game Award nominees uh, more from the Game Awards to come December the 13th is the date to mark in your diaries it's and less the, than a month the very last nugget uh, for this week is Shenmue 3 finally launched on Monday Tuesday Tuesday I think it was um, developed was it by like 20 years late or something like that 20? Uh, I wasn't that late it's was, it was like 20 years since the originals yeah, but, yeah that might be it. but it was a kickstarted and it was it was delayed from like last year or whatever uh, into this year Develop, developer EaseNet published by Deep Silver um, it averaged a 70% on Open Critic 60% of the critics recommended based on 8 reviews so it's not not a lot of people played it let's be honest everyone's been talking about Google Stadia this week it's kind of flown so under the yeah. radar that um, I, I, I doubt I doubt many of our viewers would have even known it was recognised yeah. that it was out well it, there was a bit of a uh controversy around the reviews because wasn't the the review embargo was actually after the game's release date which is a which is a bit bonkers originally, originally it was like the 21st yeah. it was today the as time of recording it was it was <laughs> the review embargo was two days after launch and then deep silver came out said that was a mistake obviously the review embargo can't be after launch because yeah. the information is already <laughs> oh, out there so it's um yeah because what wants to stop someone just buying it playing it and reviewing it <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So the review, they 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 fixed that mistake. They said the review embargo was the nineteenth, uh, the day of launch. So not not many people kind of bothered reviewing it by the sounds of it. There you go. That's what it is. Uh, just a brief snippet of the reviews. Then Polygon <coughs> said Shenmue Three is a is passable as nostalgia, but not as a game. So that's one of the one of the worst I, ones. That I think is where just quickly Jedi Fallen Order's done well because it's not just Star Wars nostalgia it is a good game it's not an amazing game but it's a good game and with the Star Wars stuff on top because it co- totally could have just coasted by on yeah lightsabers and stormtroopers mm. yeah well, there you go so Eurogamer's Martin Robertson recommended the game he said a bewitching time capsule that transports us to late 80s China and to turn of the century video games uh, that's a roundabout way of saying yeah it feels old but it's like good old yeah it's good old exactly games radar uh, Justin Towell and didn't score it but he did say this game feels like it's trolling modernity modernity it's ludicrously self-indulgent constantly absurd often beautiful objectively awful and yet somehow wonderful <laughs> is this Death Stranding? <laughs> <laughs> maybe personally I can't believe what I'm playing. Somehow Shenmue 3 is not only real, but it feels 100% authentic after all this time and against all the odds. So, new game, old game. Uh, stayed faithful to the style of the original and gameplay of the original by the sounds of it. Some people don't like the, that. Some people love that, despite of its its flaws. And uh, I remember playing the original re- more recently, and I was just so surprised at how bad the... Um, the, the control scheme was uh, I played it on Game Pass but then you do have to f- factor in that it was maybe one of the very first 3D um, third person action games yeah and it's sort of open world isn't it I yeah, think. yeah sort of um, so it, it was kind of groundbreaking this time it doesn't seem to have moved on a lot if you were fan, a fan of the original and the original mechanics and you played the old ones Shenmue 1 and 2 recently on Game Pass 
you will probably love this by the sounds of it. That's just my brief snippet yeah. based on these um, impressions. It's, and a, these it's a very tricky line to walk because it isn't a reboot. It is uh, Shinmu 3. Uh, so it's a sequel, so it's got to stay at least in some way the same as the other ones, but because it's come out so long after the last one, it can't change too much. Yeah. So I, I felt it hadn't aged well when I played the original one. I didn't play the second, but I played the original one. It hadn't aged well. And if they've remade, or if they've made number three in the ve same vein as the originals, then that just leaves a question mark over me. But that's it. That's your roundup of the news we missed and you missed uh, this week. So hopefully you enjoyed that. And like I said, this is a new segment. And if you did enjoy it, leave us some feedback. Talk about the me messages about what was your favorite topic we discussed, the thing, thing that we missed or whatever. And, um, and let us know whether you want us to do this again in future because... Um, because I had fun. I don't know if you did, but uh, yeah. we could do this again. But it all depends on whether everybody's having fun. So there's, there's so many little stories that are like, oh, that's a little fun fact, a little one paragraph yeah. thing. But it's not worth doing like a 10 to 15 minute video. on. We don't do the news roundups anymore yeah. because of reasons um, that this is an easy way to do it. Yeah. Just let us know if you enjoyed it. Anyway, let's move on to the next segment, which is the topics of discussion suggested to us by the Patreon community. Head over to patreon.com forward slash pretty good game. And if you want to get access to the Discord where you can ask us questions, which is coming later in the podcast, as well as suggest things for us to talk about. So let's jump in with these. Most what of the have? questions turn into full discussions anyway. Uh, so the first discussion point is from uh, Rudy Manchego. What do gamers want from the next generation of consoles? For example, journo leader Jason Schreier has tweeted that the PS5 is going to lead hev lead yeah lead heavily into minimal loading times and a choice on what components are downloaded <coughs> and install ah, and installed for each title. For me, this is a huge selling point as minimal boot up and getting his games quickly slash minimal load times are important to me as a gamer with limited time. Totally agree. Huge fan of the load times thing, but what do gamers want from the next gen of consoles? I, th I feel like it's a bit presumptuous of, of me as an individual to suggest what, what g collectively gamers want. Well, but uh, quick things, but like performance, better frame rates, better resolutions, better load times, uh, faster downloads and installs. Mm -hmm. I think is uh, obvious. New and advanced mechanics, because I think. When I think of a mechanic-focused game like Shadow of um, Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War, that's like one core mechanic. And if you put that into a more powerful hardware, you can then expand upon that and have more orcs, more different interactions, more variety, stuff like that. Just advance that because you've got more resources. But ultimately, for me, it's just good, good games. Good games yeah. is all I need. I think a, a large part of why consoles are still popular... Uh, versus like PC gaming is obviously price price point and convenience I think more yeah. than anything convenience and I think totally. this um, suggestion that you can play games within s seconds of starting to download it because it just downloads the very critical uh, first get first like half an hour of yeah, game hopefully first. more than just the menu it's like you can start the game no I can't well, well maybe it, while, while you're loading in the menu it's loading the first 10 minutes of the game and then while you're playing the first 10 minutes it's loading the second no, but 10 minutes I mean, like, that's the, the point the way right? it works now is like oh you can play the game no I can't I can get to the menu and customise <laughs> <Yeah>. my options <laughs> yeah you can get to the the very first area and just run around and just look in nothing there room. whatever um, but yeah, convenience, if they can have that as a selling point, then it calls into question whether Google Stadia is even, I mean, we question whether Google Stadia is legitimate anyway. Who, like, who does it, everyone says, who is it for? Yeah. Who is Google Stadia for? It's for people who uh, who want to play games straight away. Well, if, if yeah. PS5 can do this, then that takes away that unique selling point. It's for people who, who can't afford to buy consoles, uh, um, provided you've already paid £400 for a, like a fibre internet connection anyway and a good tv <laughs> to look at it on exactly well, see, if you're playing stadia at home you've probably just already got a console anyway so you're not gonna bother playing yeah. it out and about is why you'd, you'd want it but there's not good enough internet out and about in most places anyway i don't know what a gamers want from the next gen of consoles i think <laughs> ideally just to be really good but reasonably priced pcs pretty much yeah <laughs> so that's basically what game co game console is anyway um, incidentally, there's a room going around right now that the launch date is November the 20th, although that's unconfirmed. It's not an yeah. official source, but November 20th, 2020. 
uh, RRP of four hundred and ninety nine dollars. Yeah, five hundred bucks. Um, so that's what the rumor mill is saying right now. The vault. That, you that's, thoughts on that? That's a it's a lot of money, but it doesn't sound too different to what previous price points were for consoles. Because how much was the uh, Xbox One and PS4 when they launched? What three hundred bucks something like that? And five hundred. It's a lot more, but again, that's a leak. And I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't sound crazy to me because it is. Well, assuming it's got such better hardware and whatnot. It is a lot of money. Do not get me wrong. Yeah. But I, I, part of me expected them to be like, yeah, seven hundred or something like that. Nah, that's going to be that's like I said. One of the selling points of the consoles is that it's not a PC. Yeah. PC price and that's seven hundred is pushing that PC price. So you can get a um, reasonable playing PC for that price. The other thing that I was making the rounds was PlayStation or Sony have. Um, filed a patent for an SSD. Now, people are speculating that this is for um, games cartridges a la the old style um, games cartridges like to be used with the PlayStation 5. Yeah, I think we've got a question about that uh, somewhere later on. Um, so just just a snippet of something we may have... Um, you might have missed this week, but that's, that's it. Thanks for your topic, Rudy. Um, yeah, and I think um, any anyone else has any suggestions for what they want from the next generation? Obviously, backwards compatibility is the the number one yeah. that they have to bring. I don't think there's any question anymore that they have to bring backwards yeah. compatibility. Especially because be for PlayStation, it's got so many good games. This, you've won this generation. <laughs> you've yeah. won it. That's the end of it. They just have to carry that through, right? Yeah. And if they and don't you've already allow people got to bring their start. games, if they don't allow to people to bring those games, it's a it's an own goal. Yeah. It certainly is. All right, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, sure. Metal Shark uh, put puts our puts forth our next topic for a discussion, and he says asks or says the following: avatars and character creation tools with games like Black Desert inspiring people to create models such as Shudu and influencers on Instagram such as Lil Maquila in games with avatars slash character creation tools should there be constraints for realistic expectations of proportions controls to prevent cyberbullying uh, in brackets literal visual identity theft by recreating others and clear ownership of copyright for those creating characters with the tools in game I read that very fast I didn't catch what it means so Henry there, can you help me out here there's a link associated with it to a BBC article and a video uh, and it, it's less specifically about games I mean the article it's so um what's her name shudu she's a a digital supermodel she's not real uh so right. they generated her like you generate a, a video game character with a character modeler and everything she's inspired by a bunch of different things but she's not a real person are you sure she's not real? no though she that that's the the um that's the journalist right <laughs> She's real. I was going to say, she looks right. <laughs> they look real. <laughs> maybe maybe they're not real. Sorry. Um, Apologies. And, uh, Distracted by Lil. <laughs> I mean, this is easy, easy discussion. Uh, Lil Maquia. Maquila. Maquella. Maquia. <laughs> Ma what? Maquia. Lil. I think I had Wiz Khalifa in my head. <laughs> so Lil, Lil oh, Maquia. Oh, I've lost it. I'm sorry. Lil Maquia. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Right, go, go look at sorry, more boobs. Um, oh. She's not real either. She's a purely <laughs> digital. Keep it together, man. Well, you, see, you see, <laughs> you just said little McQueer. Yeah. How am I supposed to keep it together after you saying that? McQueer. Oh dear, little McQueer. <laughs> <laughs> She's not fully queer, just a little McQueer. <laughs> oh, um, shit. So yeah, yeah so she's not real. She's a digital, uh, like Instagram influencer. She's got like a million followers. <laughs> And okay. she, she's maintained by some Instagram uh, influencer agency or something. So with that in mind, the, the question's kind of about should there be rules on creating characters in video games or whatever, perhaps that are based on real people and using their likenesses and stuff. Yeah. Um, because avatars are already used for advertising, fashion, and adult entertainment. Yes. Using them in fashion is really bizarre to me because if you're watching someone walk down a a runway or model something, surely you want, they want to be wearing the real clothes. I mean, I get it for perhaps for like 
uh, rehearsing or something. So, okay, well, I'm going to draft this design. Let's put it on this model and let's just quickly render it, see what it looks like, rather than going up, you know, recruiting someone, then shooting it, and then not necessarily going anywhere. That makes sense, but actually putting out a a project in a digital form like that seems a bit weird to me. Well, I feel like uh, if you create a character um, that is of such high fidelity like that, I feel like it should operate in the same way as photos of you. Like, you own the license to that. That's yeah. your thing. Um, however, with things like Facebook, they already own everything about you anyway. Everything you upload to Facebook, you don't own, they own. And wasn't there a thing recently where they can then use your pictures for advertising or whatever. You don't own any of it. And if you tell them not to, they they were like, no, well... T's and C's, it's, it's bitch. T's and C's, exactly. T's and C's, bitch. <laughs> Basically, it's like, that's it, that's it, that's the response. I don't think there should be controls to prevent cyberbullying in terms of what you create. So if you want to create someone with the, the biggest booty in town, mm. you should be allowed to do that. And then if people are going to shame someone who hasn't made the biggest booty in town, that's not the game's fault, that's the people's fault. And that needs to be addressed um, in that way. Um, constraints for realistic expectations and proportions? No. I mean, if you're making, if you are using it for a fashion campaign, it's probably a good idea to make your human look like a human and not look like a monstrosity like what we see a lot of the time in character creators. Yeah. I, I mean, the question here relies on, if I, if I got this question straight, because it's a, it's, a, it's a big question. Big, it's a big sentence and you know it goes right over my head if it's more than five five words um so ask asking about like um copyright on their own image images right so if these instagram models have been recreated in a game or whatever then you're asking should they be constrained to keep her proportions accurate kind of thing is that well so if if i want to replicate i don't know Who's a fantastic woman? Uh, Scarlett Johansson. Say I want to make her in yeah. um, Cyberpunk. A huge RPG coming out with presumably a lot of character customization. Should I be almost legally beholden to making her actually look like her? Yeah. Or am I allowed to take liberties with it? But then what if you happen to look be someone who, in, yeah. who isn't a celebrity Looks and who that. does just look like that? I, I want to make myself look like myself and myself happens to look like one of the most beautiful people on the planet aren't I lucky yeah, uh, th yeah no it's one of these things where new technologies bringing in further moral dilemmas essentially it's like do you own your exact image or how you look in other medium if someone can create yeah. that by I think the, the, the grey area is something like um, you heard of deep is it deep fakes deep fakes yeah deep fakes where they're what they're doing is they're taking a pic image of celebrities and sticking them on after, in post processing um, on porn actors so that it yeah. looks like your um, your favourite celebrity is performing these sex acts in a porn kind of thing. And that whole thing, that whole thing was like raised a question over the morality of it, whether this um, this was right or wrong. And, and it's been totally cracked down now on Reddit and everywhere else. People are, are not allowed to share the links yeah. to these. I think fakes. if you want to make it for yourself, I wouldn't really have a problem with it. But as soon as you put it in the public domain, their professional reputation yeah. is in question because some of them are really high quality, even non sexual deep in your professional opinion yeah, exactly. <laughs> no um there's a youtube channel called uh, corridor and then a spin-off channel called corridor crew who do all their like special effects and it's kind of like a behind the scenes thing and they do a bunch of deep fakes they did one where they got a tom cruise impersonator and then deep faked tom cruise's face onto his face yeah. so it, it's pretty much exactly, exactly the same yeah um so then <clears throat> if you put that in the real world with them doing something horrendous like if you're you go murder a homeless man but you've the video footage makes it look like tom cruise is doing it yeah tom cruise is going to get a lot of shit and that's essentially oh. uh well at the bare minimum is defamation uh, yeah in this day and age where you know it's cancel cultures rife people want to want to the biggest scoop to scoop on celebrities and that and and they just want to you know twit 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 is a thing and people yeah. just want to get the juiciest bit of like outrage on any one celebrity any one time 
this is a very it's a minefield because you don't know what's real and what's fake these yeah. days even to the point is that you're looking at somebody's face words are coming out of their mouth and you don't know anymore whether that is actually them saying it that's how questionable information yeah. is becoming these days um, so it, it's I, I think there should be protections I think that I mean not for me but for, for other people who, who don't want to be misrepresented by other people who are trying to make money essentially because yeah. they wouldn't do it otherwise or, or trying to you know get their get their rocks off or whatever i think that there should be um restrictions in place to allow people to main retain their image rights um even if someone's recreated them in a in a in a i think you should be totally in control of how you know how you're represent yeah i feel like that should be the responsibility of these so let's go back to scarlett johansson example if we take her like agent it's his responsibility to manage her as as an actor and as a brand as a business person all that so it should be his job to then reach out to the, any sites or companies or whatever using her likeness without her permission and their permission and him being like, right, take it down. Yeah. I feel like if you upload it and it someone's cool with it, like if you, I saw one recently, which was Keanu Reeves painted on uh, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and it was really good because uh, yeah. he, he's a, a popular fan cast. I imagine someone like Keanu is going to be like, yeah, that's cool. I'm not going to... Yeah. I'm not going to get in trouble for it. But if he's not cool with it, he should be allowed to say, no, stop it. Yeah. But I don't think it should be blanket banned like from the start. I think it should be down to the individual's discretion. Yeah, obviously, it, you know, you can't you can't blanket ban these things because people will get banned from even drawing exactly. other people's images, which is ridiculous. And we should never go down that route, that's for sure. Yeah. But when it comes to defamation yeah. and uh, making, you know, just destroying somebody's reputation and through if you're making use money of their imagery too. I think yeah exactly and yeah. making money I think there needs to be certain restrictions and certain controls in place to allow people to stop that shit happening if they want it to but anyway that's a deep and very um I mean, it, it's a it's a huge discussion that is going to be yeah. continuing for way into the future with all yeah, the technology and shit. So I think we're we're only just starting to have this conversation yeah. about uh, like f assen it's essentially like the first step towards like AI and robots and stuff because we haven't got them in the real world who look fully human and fully functional, but we've got them in the digital world now that can actually behave and do things. And they mocap them now. There was one in the linked article of a X supermodel who now works at a tech firm which is like the biggest level up ever so like, oh i'm a ditzy blonde supermodel what a stereotype and it's like no i'm not i'm gonna go work at a tech firm and make so she made and mocapped a digital model of herself modeled onto her catwalk routine or whatever you want to call it yeah. so she still is being used as a model but like digitally which i think is really interesting and weird but yeah, the next step will be robots. But um, we're not and, there yet. And to lead the, uh, to leave this, um, I just want to leave this topic with one scary thought in the back of your minds. Imagine if someone like Donald Trump was to die, and they kept him alive <clears throat> in the public image, like nobody ever knew he died because they could use this yeah. deep fake thing. Yeah. And then, you know, his his rule continued beyond his death through like the puppeteers yeah. who were pulling the strings. I mean, essentially that could happen and that could happen anywhere in the world now yeah. and nobody would be any of the wiser. What if, That's a scary thought. What if people, because uh, Donald Trump certainly has a lot of haters in the world, what if someone hired an actor who looks of like the same build and same kind of um, mannerisms and learned the role, they got him on camera to go and uh, beat someone up Again, we're using the Tom Cruise example of beating up a homeless guy, but then in post they painted Donald Trump's face on it. That's his entire presidency called into question. Because even if everyone denounces it and it's like, yeah, even the creators come out and say, no, no, it wasn't real, it wasn't real. There'll be a set of people who are like, Donald Trump just beat up a homeless guy, yeah. which is which is ridiculous. Fake, fake news. Fa yeah, that is <clears throat> fake news. Anyway, moving on. Big Doc, uh, do you want to read this one? Cause I okay, yeah. One. Uh, I had a question. I had a question, but this jumped in my newsfeed. Y'all got too involved in my murder, marry, shag question that I guess you did not realise that my that was my secondary question. So just like last week, what are your thoughts on articles like this? How does it impact the rights of the consumer? And he linked to a Forbes article titled "Google Confirms Android Camera Security Threat." hundreds of millions of users affected so essentially it's a security risk where hackers can access your phone camera completely remotely without you knowing uh, to take photos or take videos or audio record you um which right. really isn't fucking good <laughs> no it's not good at all um and it seems that in a case like that consumer rights are totally overlooked by google 
and it is their responsibility to sell a functional product and recall it if it is defective. Well, yeah, how are these hackers, that's my first question, how are these hackers able to access your um, phone camera uh, as well as microphone? Like, what, what's the process like? Do they have to get a, could they just do it without installing any software on there? Is it just because of, of a security um, flaw in the phone itself that people can just remotely access them? Is it done yeah. by a local Bluetooth or whatever? That's the, my first question. Yeah, I, th I think it's done completely remotely. Like, they don't even have to have um, hands-on access with the thing, but I might be wrong. Yeah. I'm just reading this quickly. But, um... It's a it's a very real risk that again with the the avatars thing is going to become more and more important as time goes on. But if as soon as I see something like Google's got well anyone's got a problem with this product because it's been hacked or whatever, then I'm like, well, re recall it. Okay. And okay. then uh, fix it. So what this is um, is a it's um, issue allowing an attacker to bypass user permissions, making it possible for any application without specific permissions to control the Google camera app. The same technique also applied to Google's, uh, Samsung's camera app. So you could, yeah. So basically software on your, so it's, you've got to get software onto your um, phone. So you'd have to install someone else's app and then using that app, they could, they could like backdoor into yeah. your camera in your, without you knowing essentially. Um, so it's a, a serious security risk. You don't, you don't, you don't have to give them access and say allow permissions. They can do that anyway. Yeah. That's that, that's that's pretty scary. Um, and it and it's I mean it raises the question of security online. Always, it's always the it's a, there's a security thing in the back of your mind. Like, are, are, is anybody at this one time uh, right now trying to scam you, trying to take money off you, trying to get your personal information? Yes, I'm guaranteed. They're that trying. People are trying. Um, That's why we got uh, VPNs and malware detectors and antiviruses and shit. And as part of being a a, a, um, a rational user of the internet is trying to secure your um, your your you know what you're doing on the internet as much as possible. Trying mm -hmm. trying to minimize your exposure. Trying don't go to the dodgy websites. Always use Trustpilot. Um, make make sure you only download apps from. Um, known sources, that type of thing, right? You've got to try and minimize your exposure. And I don't think you, you should always, always, always um, acknowledge or always assume that someone is going to try and rip you off yeah. with whatever you do. And if you take it from that standpoint, then then you can o you'll only go about it uh, in a security conscious way. And that's the that's the only way that you should ever use the internet. Essentially, I think it's that um, yes. You could you should assume that every single app on your phone might hack into your um, camera, yeah. even on your laptop, for example. Some someone could be watching. You know, people are. This is a serious consideration for a lot of people. Obviously, Big Doc feels it because yeah. he's, he's he's all Co about these the conspiracy, conspiracy theories. theories and that. And he and he obviously believes that this is a um, significant threat and it's and it's real. And you know, it's not just the tinfoil hat that he's wearing. Um, these type of things. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are. You know, lots of people who are trying to scam us in these ways, and we're just going about our business, you know, I ignorant of that fact. I think a lot of people consider the internet to be uh, too much of a luxury in a way, if that makes sense. Like, um, that it, oh, it's just so handy that, and I, it, I don't use it for life. It's so I don't need to worry about it being dangerous. But it's the same. Like, if you're crossing the street, you you look. Well, you're supposed to look both ways. The amount of times I see people who don't do that, you, you look both ways so you don't get run over. When you're using the internet, it should be the same thing. You're making sure you're being safe. But I think a lot of people don't don't just doesn't enter their mind and think about it. Yeah, but there you go. We're going to come back with another discopic. Discopic. discussion topic there you go discopic the discopic yeah. of the week another discussion topic in just a second and then followed by the um, questions and everything else so don't go away we'll be right back and welcome back to the second part of today's podcast we're going to jump straight into the next topic of discussion set to us by our community and next up it's cloney uh, is it my turn to read here's uh, a topic to, to be discussed in depth 
what do you think, in your own words, is the influence of critics who are all respect for the vocation aside, sitting on the sidelines throwing a popcorn at people who work really hard to create something original sometimes on the creation of video games? So what do you think is the influence of critics on the creation of video games? How many things are implemented into a game to accommodate the critics? For example, the dreaded new mechanics every game has to have. And how many things are specifically left out? Because... A critic might not enjoy it. One might remember the discussions around Dark Souls slash Sekiro. Do you believe that the job of a video game critic who has to complete games in a given amount of time when they rate them with at least some effect on the public opinion and also slash therefore on the stock of the company publishing slash creating the game? I think that is harmful to the creation of new video games, new genres, new mechanics. <laughs> And then he continues, how do you see your role as mostly news channel with occasional review slash experience pieces in that picture? Well done for uh, reading that without error. Thank you. You, you did pretty well. So essentially... It, what is, it is my full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> reading. Well, we, we still fuck it up on a daily basis. We always fuck it up. Um, yeah, I mean, so this question is about the role of reviewers and critics and the potential damage they do to the game development creation process or yes. the industry i suppose yes um i think from a artistic from an artist's point of view you should never leave something out of what you're creating just to a just because someone might not enjoy it be mm -hmm. that a reviewer or just a general consumer you should be making whatever you want however mm -hmm. there is the risk that that won't sell because it, it will be what someone doesn't like, but you shouldn't change it for them. That does come with the risk of it not selling, but that's your, like, burden. Yeah. I feel like stuff, like, altering your design for consumers does make business sense because it will probably make you more money. And if people objectively across the board don't like this sort of thing, it's probably a good idea not to put it in so long as that doesn't get in the way of your, like, artistic vision and yep. your process. But, um... I think the role of the video game critic, and that's both like mainstream media reviewers or YouTubers or whatever, whatever level, is hugely important to the industry and and essential, not just for consumer um, awareness and buyer awareness and knowing what you're getting for your money, but also to tell the creators because the general population on things like Reddit and uh, Metacritic user scores aren't as articulate as some people who are professional writers. Some are terrible and just fill it with fluff and yeah. pretentiousness, but they're generally trained to be able to articulate their point more clearly with writing. So I feel like that kind of criticism is going to be more valuable to an artist than someone who's just, oh, I don't like this because this. And that's the end of the sentence. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's a very careful tightrope to walk when listening to criticism it's part of our job to listen to criticism and it's part of anybody who creates anything to listen to criticism and you've got to value criticism by your own um by your own standards and i think that's the important way to approach it <clears throat> if a game developer is listening to all criticism and trying to um, trying to change everything about their game based on what everyone's saying then you'll end up with nothing. You'll end up with something that is just like no artistic vision, something trying to pander to everybody, something that's worthless. Um, whereas if you take very, you know, if a bunch of critics are saying one thing about your game, um, something sh shit and generic, like doesn't bring anything to the table, then obviously you can assess that on your own merit and think that's just worthless criticism. That's yeah. just nothing. Or, or some other criticism, the same. As, I mean, obviously you've got to, you've got to judge it by, by your own... Um, it's about Standards. all your goals, what you try to achieve, like linking back to the Death Stranding comments, it's got rubbish combat and it's not a good action yeah. game, but it's not trying to be. So criticizing it for saying it's a bad action game, it's it's, it's not yeah. incorrect, but it's not the most accurate thing to say because that's not what the creator was intending. Or no, I th I, no, I think it's totally valid. I think that if you're going to make this game the way it is, 
you've just got to own it. You've got to say, right, this game it isn't f uh, for people who want combat. And if you say you're criticizing the game for combat, that's your flaw, yeah, that's right? Fun. This is this what the game is. And if you're criticizing it for that reason, then you've just missed the game. It's not for you, whatever. It you've got to be fine bad. with that. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make the game yeah. bad. You just got to be fine with that. And I think that you've got to own that. You know, you make a yeah. creative decision. You've got to own that. And you've got to stand up and people say, it isn't this, it isn't that. Well, that's just a fact. It isn't a combat game. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, there's, no, there's nothing critical about that. It's like, it's, well, there's nothing like, it's like eating an apple and saying you wish it was an orange. It's like, fundamentally, it's not. Yeah. It's just not what it is. But I think the role of um, critics is a very important role. Um, in the same way that games that go into early access in order to get feedback from the player base while they're developing the game, they're able to create games that otherwise wouldn't be as has feature complete and as well crafted as they would otherwise have been. If if you listen to criticism in the right way, you can end up with a greater product, a greater game. Um, and it's important that the the, the you know the the critics do point out things that are obvious, things like monetization, shit like that, S things like being too greedy with your game. That's the kind of thing that developers should be listening to and taking note of and changing in their games, um, especially the, the AAA games. And it's, it's a very important role, and it has to be done right. But it's a, it's a it, like I said, it, it is a tightrope. You can't listen to them too much in case you you completely s sell out to them and just and just um, hand over all creative integrity to what other people's opinions are, essentially. Um, but you've got to hold fast to, and, and listen to what they're saying sometimes when when somebody points out something obvious. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think, yeah, it's, it's an important role that we as critics play. And, um, and I think without us, I think um, they'd get away with too much shit and the games wouldn't, I mean, yeah, I hate this narrative. Like, for example, like this doesn't bring anything new to the table. I hate that narrative, but I love it when games do bring something new to the table. And those two thought feelings can be, um, I can hold those at the same time. Let's not pan a game for not being, um, bringing anything new to the table because you can have a fantastic game without bringing anything new to the table. And that's been proven multiple times. Horizon Zero Dawn, Days Gone's another example. And um, I guess, you know, if you're if you like Jedi Fallen Order yep. as well, that's another example, right? But it doesn't mean a game's necessarily bad because of it, and you shouldn't slate it for that. You should maybe make that observation because that is a as a fact. You know, it's a it's a, it's just a fact. Yeah. It's not a criticism. It's a, it's, it's a game you've played before, but here's a new story or something yeah. like that. And at the same time, a game like Death Stranding can bring loads of new things to the, the table and be its own artistic, artistic vision. Try different things, be experimental. And I like that for a different reason than I like another game. I, I wouldn't enjoy playing Death Stranding, but I love it. Exi love that yeah. it exists. And I'd love I love playing games like Days Gone, even though it's very very generic. So. And an observation is not necessarily criticism sometimes, yeah. right? Great thing about Death Stranding, there's a lot of like uh, op heads going around now and like feature articles being like, you should be playing Death Stranding right now. Everyone should be playing Death Stranding because it's a it's an important it will be an important game in, in games history, certainly for a little while anyway, for being kind of new and because it's so divisive. I disagree with that idea. You shouldn't not everyone should be playing it because if everyone's playing it, a, lo a lot of people really aren't going to like it, and you don't want to waste your time doing that. Yeah. You should be like you. You can enjoy it as a passive observer, being like, "Oh, I like the idea of it. I like that it's new, but I don't need to in directly engage with it. Yeah. I can passively engage with it by just understanding. Oh, it's a brand new thing, doing new ideas. I like that. Not for me. And I'll move on." Yeah. Uh, what do you think in your own words is the influence of critics on, critics on the creation of video games? I think more and more um, the influence of critics is having a bearing on the development of video games. For good and bad, I think that um, games in future will be better for having having more feedback, more constructive criticism. I think that the industry is developing faster and games are being pushed f further and we're looking for more because you think about the average reviewer he just sits there um, reviewing game after game after game like a generic game that he's played uh, an open world game for example that he's played loads of times before like very fam familiar mechanics they're just going to get bored of that and, yeah. and it doesn't mean that it's a bad game or no, one, no other one's gonna, nobody else is going to have fun with it 
that's just a symptom of how it is, right? So he's crying out for a new mechanic, for new types of gameplay innovations or whatever. And, you know, some developers will listen to that and, and break ground because of that, right? And that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. That's just the way it, way it goes. And I see that as, that's fine, right? If that's yeah. the way that people want to develop games um, to try and cater for these reviews. At the same time, you've got to be wary that people aren't just, pan games aren't being made just to pander to these reviewers. And I've, the prime example of that is, is the the indie games that are just like these one-off experiences <laughs> which are very little gameplay and um they just offer something special for that that reviewer that's just stuck in this rut of reviewing game after game it's like yeah. something original comes along like oh this is game of the year material and it's like it's just a shitty two-hour indie get walking simulator indie game and you i'm not going to name any names here but you can probably yeah. get the picture of what i'm talking about but that's why so many of these indie um experiences get nominated for these awards and stuff by those those reviewers whereas objectively they're not that great a game but because they're new and it brings a different experience to the those reviewers um they get ha they get um a lot of acclaim for yeah it. but it's like you well, just gotta like be a little careful <laughs> if you're uh, changing your game or your artistry in any medium like if it's a film or music or whatever if you're changing that for the benefit of the reviews you're a bad artist you're a bad game maker well i know for, there's, a, for, there's a certain amount of catering but i think i think you've got to give a little bit Oh, you I can give a little a, bit, a balance. but so long you're, if you're like balance. fundamentals of what you want to be doing... Oh, yeah, if you give up your whole yeah. artistic vision and, and you give everything over to other people's desires, then you're lost, yeah. essentially. And like with a game You've like Death Stranding, it, it, it fits the narrative and the thematics of it to have weak combat because it, <clears throat> he's not a soldier. You're not playing as a soldier, and death is a massive part of it. And even when you get lethal weapons... Great movie. Even when you get lethal weapons... Uh, you're encouraged not to use them on humans. Yeah. Like, don't do it because it's just going to mean bad things for you and shit's going to happen. Well, so uh, anyway, thanks for your question, Cloney. We're going to have to move on because yeah. we're running out of time. And <laughs> we tried to squeeze so much into this video that um, that that was a you know 10-minute discussion on that. And we could have carried on. We could have carried on. Well, did we did ask supposed for to be, a deep we, uh, yeah, chat. We were supposed to be concise, but... Um, uh, hopefully we've done that question justice we're going to have to move on now to the Discord specific questions and hopefully we can run through these reasonably uh, fast clip because we've got to go to the YouTube best YouTube comments of the week after that so first up uh, do you want to read yeah. the first this is uh, not that Rob Lowe's question and in case you don't know every week for the past few weeks he's been asking us the same question which is what was your favourite game of the year of your birth and then plus one and so when you're born, then one year old, two years old, three years old. And the caveat is that you have to have played it, but obviously you don't have to have played it at the time. You can play it in retrospect. So now we are on year 11. And uh, the question is, well, the, his references. You know the drill. I've never played Monkey Island, so I'll have to apologize for that, Gaz. But my games of 1990 were Super Mario World, Act Razor, Smash TV, with an honorable mention for Pit Fighter. Didn't play any of those. Sorry. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Rob. <but I> don't <laughs> Well, for me, I'm a young wee nipper snapper, and uh, is, this, is that the word nipper snapper? Is that the word? Whipper like, snapper. That's it. Whipper. I was like nipper. That's wrong. That's you're like not whipping. You're nipping. I'm gonna nip your nips. My my <laughs> year was 2006. Um, so we got Dead Rising, the original Marvel Ultimate Alliance, Call of Duty Three, which I don't think gets enough love. It had like a three three or four different nation campaign. I love that. Uh, Lego Star Wars 2, the original Just Cause, Bully, which I haven't actually personally played, but a lot of people like it, Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle Earth 2, which is a real mouthful, Saints Row, and GTA Vice City, but my personal one is Gears of War, and I didn't play that when it first came out, because I didn't own an Xbox 360, but I got one, um, I think more or less in line with when Gears 2 came out, because I got 1 and 2 together as like a bundle with the Xbox, and it was life-changing. It was that that, that game is the reason I got an Xbox because uh, I was I watched I caught it on TV once and I was like that looks amazing it's all like brown and grey and gritty and I'm like uh, just about to become an edgy teenager not quite yet but I'm almost <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh there's, there's then there's blood and it's fine oh that, that's really cool oh he's got a chainsaw that's dope uh, so yeah I don't know my game taste yeah. wouldn't be the same without Gears of War I don't think there you go thanks uh, obviously great answer there because a life-changing game is uh it's definitely fits the bill for this question so my year was um what the fuck year am i 91 
Oh, I'm so old, I can't even remember. Mm. And you weren't even born by then. Nope. And I feel so old uh, for that. But right. But anyway, there's a bunch of games. Uh, this is like my prime gaming years now. Commodore Amiga, sitting in my bedroom, playing these games with the floppy disks. I mean, what what are you not doing at the age of 10? So, um, Micro Machines was, um, I, I don't think I, I was on Amiga, but it was one of the ones. Sonic the Hedgehog, obviously on the... Um, on the on the consoles, the dirty consoles. Um, Turrican Two was a, a game that I played a lot of. Hunter was an amazing 3D game before its time, and it should and should be better. I, it's one that I just like. I saw and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I played that game back in back in the day. Hunter, look it up. I, t- I tell you, if you've played it, you'll remember it. It was it was very impactful. Um, Alien Breed was a f- fantastic game. It's just a well-made game. It was fantastic, beautiful, top-down shooter. Street Fighter Two was from that era too. Lemmings was my runner-up. Lemmings, Lemmings was my runner-up, like the strategy game, still classic game to this day. But the winner this this week for me, 1991, Another World. This was amazing. It was known as Out of This World in America, apparently. It was a cinematic platformer action adventure game designed by Eric Chai, uh, published by Delphine Software. And if you've played it, you'll know what it's about, right? The opening sequence is this guy speeds in his race car to his laboratory it's a dark night it's um <laughs> i can say it's very vivid and it's uh, the lightning uh, is going on in the background he gets into his laboratory cracks open a can of coke starts his um scientific experiment and just as like the hadron collider thing is is going a bolt of lightning like hits the laboratory and the whole thing and, and you included disappears and just um, reappears in this other world and you start from like the desk you were sat at is underwater and you're just like drowning essentially you've got to swim up and just emerge in this new world and it's like deep science fiction type of world big black dogs running at you and um, you've got phaser guns and, and shit like that amazing absolutely amazing I think Flashback was the second game in the series again another fantastic game but um, uh, that's it's one of the ones that is just just brilliant uh, for, for its time I think it's it was top notch I think they remade it I, I bought it on my phone recently as well and played it on my phone it was it was that memorable but thanks for your question Mr. This lo- looks very much blah, like blah. a game that would be like made now as like some cool small scale indie project yeah like it's, it was a fantastic game because you know eventually awesome you're running away from these people trying to catch you they do catch you they they chain you up whatever and you escape and you get yourself a gun and then you shoot and they in the flashback in the in the sequel i think it was a sequel it's like a spiritual success at the very least there's like flying cars and shit and it's like <laughs> all right it's a 2d uh, it's a side scrolling thing uh, but oh my god it was just a just a great you know if that's sort of experience back in the day you might have played flashback no, no. Ring any bells? No. Anyway, let's well, move on to the, the description next you said about a guy who gets like zapped by lightning and then travelled to this other place. It made me think of a game. I have no idea what it's called, but we had it on PS One. It we didn't work. That was my prevailing memory of it. Like the back of the box looked cool. It looked really fun. Like, sort of like a Back to the Future book, sort of fantasy vibe. If you get sent to this other place, but the disc never worked. Oh, so I never actually it. played it. Let's move on now to the next question, and this is my favourite question this week. I've got to be honest. Aki Marin, I think it's the f- your first uh, attempt at that question. I'm not sure. Hey guys, I'm a big fan of your podcast. I'm listening to it on my work, on my to work and back, and I commute. I'm sure he means there. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what used to be one of my favourite franchises, Pokemon. Oh, this isn't the. Yeah, he's got another one. Uh, oh, it's the other question. Sorry, um, yeah, we're this, getting to the, this my favourite question. Favorite question. Is shit. <laughs> this question is sh- sucks compared to your other one. There was a lot of controversy surrounding the launch of new Pokemon games. At one point, an event got cancelled, presumably due to health threats, death threats. Some fans were unhappy with the way Game Freak was handling their favourite franchise. Just to name a few of the issues, Pokemon included being excluded from the game, a lack of graphic quality, copy and paste, older models, animations. Ex- so this was. The question was put to us before we released our video on. Um, I thought you said you put that on silent. I have put it on silent. <laughs> she phones me twice and it comes through the, the filter. I need to take her off my favourites. <laughs> um, Do not yeah. disturb. Uh, so, obviously, this question was put to us before the Monday uh, video. The game has been out for a few days now. The reviews are positive and the first day sales are pretty good. Some people are. <clears throat> are very positive on social media towards Game Freak to show that people care to outweigh the death threats and upset fans. Do you think Game Freak, the Pokemon company on Nintendo, will put more pressure on the next title because of the fans' outrage? Or do you think the reviews and sales are the only things that matter to them? Do you think that Pokemon might become Nintendo's FIFA with the early release 
that is not really groundbreaking. I really hope that this does change their uh, mentality because outrage is there for a reason. People get excited because they have expectations and when they're not met, um, basically it's a message to the developers to say you could have done better and hopefully they listen to some of that. Um, again, they've got to go, th you've got to filter all the criticism through their own standards and see what, what really hits home and what is just like hate or whatever. But I really hope this does change for the better for everybody. I think calling it po uh, Nintendo's FIFA is pretty accurate because it's almost already there. Uh, the only, it's, it's just not yearly yet. Uh, but the fact that there's been so many games with so little innovation, it, there are similarities to be drawn with FIFA, although, I mean, they do change generations. You have different uh, Pokemon added and evidently taken away. But yeah, I, I, hopefully this will put pressure on them to uh, just be better and not yeah. necessarily Game Freak because we don't exactly know the conditions of their development because if reusing these old models or whatever that might have been mandated by Nintendo or people higher up normally it, uh, it, pretty much every time anything like this happens I don't blame the individuals at Game Freak or the individuals who have been doing it you blame the people at the top who are yeah. making all the decisions and who don't ha get in any trouble for it I feel like uh, this is one of those situations where it's a he said she said yeah. did they say didn't they say and, and then and translated I <laughs> yeah I feel like them coming out and being completely transparent with it would 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 be a lot more accepted by the community and people will be more understanding if they just and if they were just honest and I think that's what they try to do by saying no we can't we can't fit everything in because we're trying to do um, uh, we're, tr we're trying to innovate or whatever I don't know I just feel like there are lessons to be learned here for sure and I think that being transparent and being as open as possible uh, is always the best way to try and keep people from getting sending death threats essentially yeah. stop sending death threats death threats Full to stop. people you piece of shit okay next question Jason Jackson hey guys what indie games have you been playing I've just finished Neo not sure I'd call Neo an indie game that, that's the Souls like yeah. Samurai one yeah I'm it's not sure I'd call it an indie game uh, and wanted to take a break from such a long, heavy game. I found a little Zelda dungeon-based game called Cat Quest. It has enough cat puns to impress Jackson Galaxy. I think I've heard of Cat Quest. It looks so. His point was goofy. he was playing Neo the AAA game, and then he yeah. Then now he fell back onto moved it. on to yeah. uh, an indie thing. Uh, great videos slash podcast as usual. Thank you very much. Uh, second question. Well, we'll cover your second question in a sec. Uh, indie games. I haven't played an indie game for a while. Um, I play. I think I spoke about it before. I play Blasphemous on the Switch, which was really fun, but it's uh, it, it, it's it's the modern Nindy niche, like, to a T. Yeah. Uh, Side-scrolling, pixel platformer, Metroidvania, Souls-like, uh, roguelike. Wow. It's all of them. Ticks all the boxes. Like, and it is quite fun. Um, amazing art. The art is really, really good, and everything's proper fucking miserable. Everything's, like... Uh, so I recently watched Ghostbusters 2 and there's a bit where because you, you know it's got the, the haunted painting and it starts speaking it's like in a castle of pain on a throne of blood in a fountain of tears everything's that it's all horrible pain death penance sacrifice doom all this shit uh, but that's been really fun but I, I never got around to finishing it I got quite far through but I think another game came out and I was getting annoyed at uh, Metroidvania the, the primary fault of it is that you, you have to backtrack a lot and sometimes it's done very well and sometimes it's not yeah. and I just kind of got sick of it it wasn't too difficult either especially as um, Souls-like goes thing uh, it was quite fine um, I didn't really like the progression in it that much and it's not very good at explaining itself yeah. about what you need to do my indie game that I played most recently was the preview of Yes Your Grace um, which is published by No More Robots. Mike, what's his name? Mike, what's his name? The game that the Biffle? guy. No, the the guy that comes out and says a lot of things. He says things against G four A or whatever. Recently. Oh, uh, Mike. yeah. I'll find that. <laughs> no, anyway, um, yeah, he sent me uh, a preview early access of um, Mike Rose. Mike Rose, yeah. He sent me early access. Uh, version of yes your grace i played that it's it's kind of like it's, it looks good right because it's kind of like um you rule your kingdom through making decisions P people your your um subjects line up and then come and ask you 
like oh will you spare some money to help feed the poor things oh uh, the thing uh, the um the inns bro- uh, burnt down will you spare some money to to do this oh there's there's a there's a threat from outside the kingdom should we send some soldiers that kind of thing a bit like um uh you know game of thrones you know where a brand sat there and he's like all these people are coming and asking him what to do um but then you know you get off your throne and you walk around you've got a family and it's all like um that was an interesting game i, I played abandoned ship and that's come out recently too it's kind of a bit a bit like ftl you could say i played that a lot in early access um a bit like ftl but it's like based on um you know, your pirate ship and your your more like a um not non non sci fi kind of thing really. Although it is sci fi I don't know. I, I really in terms of um I do give a lot of indie games a lot of time, but I don't necessarily talk about them a lot. Um that's the thing. I do I do pick up um like switch indie games and stuff and yeah. but um yeah it's always just like trying this out, see what it's like trying this especially yearly access and stuff like that because because um, I just I just like, like indie games and like to support them too. So I've, I've been meaning to for ages to turn my Switch into my little indie platform. And there's so many games I've got like on a list in my head of like that I really want to play some old games, some new ones. But then um, September happened, <laughs> which yeah. had uh, like Control and Astral Chain. Still haven't played Astral Chain. And then there was Gears. And then there was Death Strand. No, yeah. then there was The Outer Worlds. And then there was Death Stranding. And then there was Jedi Fallen Order. And those last three I still haven't finished. <laughs> so I've got to go back to all yeah. of them before I start anything new. I think the last one I bought was Moonlighter on Switch. Again, another indie game that's reviewed really well. Um, I played I played a bit of it. Got a bit bored, I'll be honest. And then uh, just left it, just like I do with a lot of games. <laughs> Thanks for your question then. The um, second part of the question was... What food oh, reminds right. you of video games? Yeah, what food reminds you of video games? I just put some piccalilli on my sandwiches and it reminded me of Fallout, mostly because of the colour. Hot dogs always remind me of Final Fantasy VIII too. Um, food reminding me of video games. I mean, any time th- you see shit like Doritos or Monster Energy Drink, I just think of wankery product placement in, uh, in ads or Death Stranding for that matter. Um, I, I mean, Monster Energy Drink so always going to remind me of Death Stranding now oh, I, I hate it I hate it so much it's not even like energy drinks are horrible but I've, I've drank a few in the past but Monster's not even the one I would choose to drink yeah it's, it's horrible although uh, semi-spoiler it, it does disappear and get replaced with something that actually makes more sense and like a fictional product in the thing so that, that's, that's that something works. food that makes me think of uh, video games I don't really know pizza for me I guess because that was the most yeah. convenient thing to cook when you're in a long gaming session when you're young right sit the oven on throw a frozen pizza in set your timer for like 10-15 minutes come back up 10 minutes come out, chop it up stick it on a side where it cools you carry on gaming the whole time and you can play and eat at the same time it's, it's simple it's nice it's the best food for gaming right that, that yeah that sounds right that but I eat junk food kind of consistently whether I'm gaming or not <laughs> well it, it's certainly not a food although it can be converted into a food uh, but anytime I'm playing Rocket League and this goes both ways or um, smoking something that isn't a cigarette I think of Rocket League because we always used to play Rocket League and let's say misbehave for the benefit of <laughs> YouTube buzzwords <laughs> misbehave and, uh, well, it, it, well tell us what you know. mean pray do tell Henry we did some knitting <laughs> it was very innocent <laughs> no yeah okay. smoking something that wasn't tobacco oh right okay that's all I'm trying to say is, is uh, Mrs. Mrs. Henry Cooper Senior listening to <laughs> you <laughs> Mrs. Henry Cooper Senior well, she listening for the benefit of that's not my mother's her. name <laughs> she's not a Cooper all oh, right. She sorry. she's she betrayed my father. <laughs> no, she didn't. Betrayal. Um, although she does say that she prefers uh, Cooper to her current name. Does she? Mm. Well, tough luck. So, I mean, yeah. Tough luck now, sure, isn't it? Sure. <laughs> my, my sister recently abandoned the family and went and got married. Now she's got a shit name. Oh uh, well. No good. There you go. And my brother went right. and double barreled his, so there's not many of us left. Right. Let's <laughs> let's uh, move on. <laughs> Um, we are trying to be concise as possible here because we're running out of time. But thanks for that uh, well, story on your, my family your, family, your family name there, Henry. Okay, next question. 
Uh, is it me or is uh, it you? Uh, let, let's say it's you. Okay. Turns asks, what is your guys' take on Sony's patent suggesting that PS5 will have proprietary expandable memory cards? I'm having PS Vita memory cards flash uh, paying out the ass for extra storage. I'm having uh, card um, flash, flashback, I guess, paying out uh, the ass for extra so storage. You touched on this it depends how they implement it right it depends if they use it for it would be awesome if their games came on flash storage instead of a disc right because it's out of date right you get a disc these days you stick it in your your in your um in your console and you've got to wait an hour for it to install that is out of date and all this talk about them trying to make uh, lower the barrier to entry like trying to enable you to play the game as soon as you, you've like started to install it or download it online or whatever it would make a lot of sense if this was their next delivery method of games mm-hmm. like games come on a flash storage so you can just whack it in and play yeah. it straight away and you, I would love that to be the you case you can't uh, scratch uh, a USB stick well you, you mean you can in theory but it's going to yeah. be a lot more effort yeah CDs or DVDs or Blu-rays or whatever you want to call them they're they're fragile and you're, you're right they are out of date now I, so long as I can get it in a box and keep my physical collection going I'd, I'd happily get a little um, yeah. little thumb drive or something with, with a game on it that's one thing about the Switch right oh, Right, there's always a day one patch but you know you could just throw the switch cartridge in and play and it's yeah it's done you don't have to install it I love that the, the switch i love because it totally blows my mind a game that is i said this before huge like breath of the wild fits onto something this this small now that's that's optimization I've, yeah. and that game runs it that's not it's not buggy at all anyway thanks for your question tons yep let's move on uh, metal shark we've got what three questions here will we see the return of henry's essay videos videos uh maybe it just they take ages to write Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a matter of whether or not that's getting in the way of doing like a news story, which is mm-hmm. much faster and more um, lucrative. Yeah, it, <clears throat> but in the confines of the YouTube um, space, I mean, it it pay, it pays for us to generate content quickly. Yeah, it doesn't matter about the quality of it. Yeah. You know, we could spend eight, two. I spent two days before now on a video, uh, something about um, gaming addiction and, and kids or whatever very little views uh, spent like an hour or two researching for one video that we do it might get 70 100 thousand views something like that so it sometimes doesn't pay and it, it is good to yeah. vary the content and I, I wouldn't i wouldn't ever rule out going no back no to, no so I, I would always hope that there's the doors open to do be as creative as we want sometimes we have to pay the bills so yeah. <laughs> simple they're quite fun to do because they're sort of hard they're quite uh stimulating because you've got a uh, like right in it intellectually and, and yeah. spend more time on it so it, it's a bit more proactive but I've I'm reviewing more now and it's just unfortunate that I've got to do Death Stranding and well I'm, I'm definitely going to review Death Stranding I'm hoping to do one for The Outer Worlds and I pro- might do one for Jedi Fallen Order but they're all at the same time and I've not finished any of them yet and really some of them are on a bit like, like The Outer Worlds I'd want to play again to make some opposite decisions to really get a full understanding of it but yeah i wouldn't ever rule them out i like doing them but six questions left and less than half an hour left to record it so jesus move on right uh so two case accounts got hacked last week they are still yet to acknowledge google's warnings of accounts being breached back in september and they still do not offer two-factor authentication on customer accounts what will it take them for them to address security concerns uh if they actually lose money it's about money yeah it's bottom line uh, yeah and it will cost money to implement that so they're probably not going to do it uh what do you think about the current spate of typing games being created did you ever play any of the original text-based adventure games or even mini game versions like frog factions I never played uh, text-based games, but yeah. I think that there's there's definitely a niche for those types of games because people love them. As it reminds me of those um, those text adventure the books. I don't know what yeah, like, I, I did the books. You like, you like to choose your own what adventure. Do you, yeah, that's yeah. it. Cho- what do you do? Do you go down to the uh, uh, into the dark cave, or do you turn around and go home? Turn, turn to page. page five yeah, yeah, I did those all the time. That was quite cool. But um, a lot of people like to read, see, and the, the big readers, and and having an adventure while they're reading. Yeah. Um, it, that's a perfect thing to serve that uh, but thanks for your question Metasark uh, what, do you, what do you think about the current space I mean it, it serves you know if there's a niche if there's a market for that type of content people always, always make them and if they don't do well that means there's not enough of a market for them or you need, just needs a, be- a better product essentially so 
um, I'm glad that they exist because they serve a part of the, the market and people out there wanting them get served. Anyway, the next question is my favorite question of yeah, the here week. We go. It's uh, Aki Marins. I mean, you member of the PGG community. I really like more creative questions on the podcast. You hear that, everyone else? Up your game. <laughs> so I'll try my hand. I come up with your own. Um, oh boy, did you come up? Did you deliver? Oh my god! This question is in the spirit of Shag Mary Kill, introducing renew sellout erase. Bear with me, guys. You are the owner of three well-known franchises. In order to keep your game company going, you have to make a new game in a franchise which will be extremely successful. So the game you're going to make will be extremely successful, but. To get the funding, we'll have to sell one franchise to EA or Activision, and you know they will just ruin the franchise with their corporate greed. In order to get the team to work on the new title, you also have to drop one franchise. And for the sake of drama, no one else will be able to play the game in the franchise ever again, even if they have a hard copy. So, would you renew, sell, or erase the following fantasy franchises? The Witcher, Elder Scrolls, Legend of Zelda. And just to recap, you renew one game, so you make another game in the franchise and it becomes a blockbuster hit. You sell one game to EA Activision and they totally trash it and monetize it to hell. And then you erase one game from the living memory. Nobody else gets to play it ever again. <laughs> okay. Um, it's the best question. I reckon I will renew The Witcher. Personally, I like that world a lot. I will sell Zelda because it's gonna be worth a whole lot of money. It's a legacy title. Send that to EA and then, unfortunately, they'll do what they need to do. And Elder Scrolls, get in the bin. Sorry. Well, you I prefer Elder Scrolls. I prefer Elder Scrolls to Zelda. That might be sacrilege, yeah. but I've just played more of it. Um, but I think Zelda will, uh, um, I need to keep my business, I need to keep my company float, so Zelda's gonna make me more money, unfortunately. Uh, okay. and, and Elder Scrolls is already you're going or, shit. Yeah. You're the CEO of this company. You're already making uh, business decisions based on what's going to make most money. So uh, good well, luck to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, I'm playing the role of the Activision EA type here. The, you're doing it really well. Yeah. My uh, my answer is slightly different. The Elder Scrolls will be the one that I renew. Um, only because I, I just love what the Elder Scrolls brings in terms of um, RBG. I just, I just love it. Like the first person and third person, I guess you could say. Um, a action a adventure game where you just go anywhere you want on the map and you'll always be entertained no matter what and I've since oblivion I've, I've just loved that formula absolutely loved it and I think I would make a new game like oblivion like oblivion was not not Skyrim so much and not um, whatever hell, uh, else they, they brought out Blades. since then um, and then it's a case of selling the witcher I'm sorry. I'm selling the witch. Okay. Well, that was uh, by default because I'm I'm erasing Zelda because I'm not a big fan of the the reprising. I'm just going to erase yeah, that, and enough. you know I'm, I'm triggering so many Nintendo uh, fanboys and just Zelda fanboys in general by saying that. I think if it wasn't if the renew wasn't a guaranteed hit, I'd renew Zelda because Zelda is a guaranteed hit. Yeah, because it's Zelda. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, The Witcher has to be sold. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, fans. That I just didn't connect. I've never connected with The Witcher as much as I've connected with an Elder Scrolls or two Elder Scrolls games, Oblivion and Skyrim. Big games for me in my past, and it's just a simple. It's just an easy answer for me that uh, The Witcher kind of has a. I mean, you sell The Witcher on. Yeah, they might monetize the shit out of it, and it's completely the opposite to why we love The Witcher at, at the current <laughs> time. But there's always hope that they sell it on again, or we buy it back, or whatever. Yeah. We, we always, and there's always hope that the old look really does. pretty. Yeah, yeah, and it look, and it look it'll fantastic. It look pretty. It won't play well. <laughs> and as Zelda is uh, cast away, never to be seen again. Thanks for that awesome question, Aki Marin. I think that 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 answer was too easy for me. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I didn't find it. I mean, it's like it's like oh, it's a great question. I surprisingly got to the answer so quick. <laughs> All right, well, next up, we've got the proper Shag, Mary Kill in the traditional format. Uh, Shag, Mary Kill, good. We need, a, we need a jingle for that. We definitely do. So I can finally complete compete with Rob's best game of the year question. Question. Qu question for the title of favorite podcast question. 
but that seriously <laughs> seriously guys you mentioned how that's your favorite so much i'm getting jealous of here and how jealous what? are you now i've just mentioned that the previous question was my favorite one of the week cloney oh, must be shit. crying and he's got a good selection this time <laughs> this cloney, is... cloney your questions are awesome too dude you, you are you're that you're that i value your top, opinion top tier your feelings triple so a questions we're not sorry what you. we said we're sorry you feel that way <laughs> <laughs> anyway this is hideo kojima edition so we got Amelie Strand from Death Stranding, Quiet from MGS5, The Phantom Pain, and The Boss from MGS3, Snake Eater. Um, so I'm quite familiar with what this lot looks like, so you might want to get up. No, uh, I, I'm George. just throwing this question over to you. We're stuck on time, okay. and you're the best one to Yeah, all right. This. Um, this is tough, but I'm going to say, I'm going to quickly breeze past it. Amelie Strand is the pre well will will be the president of the United States once it's reformed and you complete Death Stranding. I've not finished it yet. I don't know if she succeeds, so I'll probably marry her. That's a whole lot of power. And she's uh, Lindsay Wagner, who's uh, she's a little bit older now, but Amelie's character is the younger version of her, so she's really really attractive. Uh, she's the marry. Shag quiet because I mean she's a attractive woman who can't speak. What what, what more do you need? Oh. It's a um, double whammy. And the boss, the boss is awesome, but I don't think she's particularly attractive, uh, and she's uh, so deceptive. Like yep. she's like a triple agent by the end of um, Snake Eater, so you can't trust her. But she's she's an amazing character, but you can't trust her. So, marry Amelie, shag quiet, kill the boss. Absolutely agree. Amelie's banging, um, quiet's quiet, and the boss is too bossy, I guess. <laughs> Uh, this is hard, you guys. Not having played any of Kojima's games yet, except Boktai, The Sun is in Your Hand for the Game Boy Advance, which he designed, apparently. Fair enough, didn't know that. I had to go by the most popular ones that I know about. Purely by looks, I'd kill the boss, tragic as she may be, shag quiet because she was already naked and needs the moisture to survive or something. I mean, you're almost there. Her lore is really stupid and is just Kojima being a creep. That's definitely not sexist. She needs the moisture to survive. It's, she, 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 wow. she is naked because she needs to uh, breathe through with photosynthesis. It's, it's of dumb. Course, yeah. It's dumb. It's dumb. Of course, yeah. And Mary Emily Strand, although she's in Death Stranding, I guess, uh, but she's in HD. <laughs> but HD. But she, she's HD, so there. Yeah, all right. We're, we're, we're all pretty much aligned with the, the Kojima ladies there. The uh, next question, Rudy Manchego. Question will be aimed at Henry. As a long term Star Wars fan, I feel the conflict within you over The Last Jedi and the current state of Star Wars. I'm not one of the negative naysayers online who sends vials to the of their excrement to studios and stars, but I'll probably not go see Rise of the Skywalker. And oddly, it's dampened my interest in Fallen Order. How are you, you feeling about the state of the franchise? And do you feel like games like Fallen Order are a step in the right direction? Shit, at the time when we're trying to speed things up, this is not going to go well. The Last Jedi, I dislike but i dislike that i dislike it more if that makes sense it's star wars i love star wars and i'm it's disappointing more than anything and it leaves it doesn't fill the star wars void in my heart and it's just so many things it's one of those where like oh if i could rewrite it i'd do this and i think that all the time like, oh i would do this i would do this yeah. I would do th one major thing if you want it i would uh, blow up the millennium falcon with chewy inside it uh, so I'll leave that in the yeah, yeah just leave that hanging yeah yeah well I'd have Kylo Ren do it with the force as a big pump, yeah. actually make him scary um, the Rise of Skywalker I'm definitely going to go see it sorting out with my brother uh, when we're going to see it because I would kind of always go with him in terms of the general new space Star Wars I like Force Awakens it's massively unoriginal and derivative but I still enjoy it it's a fun Star Wars movie yeah. don't like Last Jedi really like Rogue One Rogue One is excellent Espe like I liked that film a lot and then it got to the Darth Vader scene and I lost my shit like a, a jo actual jaw dropping moment in the cinema where I felt myself go oh my god mm. uh, Han Solo was fine generic space action movie didn't need to be a Star Wars film but it's fun and I think it got a lot of uh, <coughs> ragging on which I don't think it deserves but it's a fair film Fallen Order is definitely a step in the right direction I'm glad that it is confident enough to address both the prequel stuff with the Clone Wars and whatnot and the original trilogy. But I don't, so far, I've not finished it yet, as I said, it's not bold enough. It's a safe Star Wars game. Hopefully, if they get the opportunity to do a sequel, they can take a few more risks and try something a bit more adventurous in terms of storytelling. But I am really enjoying it so far, and I definitely think it's a step in the right direction, especially for the games industry side of Star Wars. Um, can, yeah, can I throw my and Mandalorian? Mandalorian is really, really good. It's really good uh, from what I've seen. I, I mean, 
I I, th- I think what I'd do to this franchise, right, is if I'd go back and erase everything that's happened ever since Ray decided not to team up with um, that, yeah, with uh, what's his name, Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren. At that moment, yeah, that franchise could have taken the best turn ever yep. and just surprised yep. everyone yep. and just made an absolute yep. smash like what what the fucking happened if they'd have teamed up at that moment yep. she decided not to lo and behold generic shit afterwards we literally that's one of the biggest changes i'd make to that movie but if you want to keep the structure the same that's fine but that yeah. change is ridiculous because that that's what we're so good just yeah. to, just to like they don't team ex- up explore what could yeah. have happened they team up and like all right fuck the resistance fuck the first order you know what fuck me let's go shag off on a planet i'm not, I'm not even one of these kylo and ray shippers i just want to see interesting stuff with the force instead of just with oh yeah the jedi are good yeah because it's boring but yeah, yeah. i feel like it's one of those franchises that gets talked about so much that to play it safe it's going to be as divisive as taking a risk. Yeah, it's it's just it's just how it is. People are expecting both on both sides of the uh, spectrum. They're expecting say, uh, the same kind of stuff, and they're expecting something new as well. And, and to be excited, the first time, like the first time they watched the franchise, if you don't take any risks, you're not breaking new ground. And oh, the last, the last, was it the last Jedi took, <sighs> took bad risks. If that makes it sense, it was so bad. It, it was, was like it's the, subverting <laughs> expectations. Yeah, but they didn't subvert them with anything else. It's like we're spoiler alert we're gonna kill Snoke alright cool That that's actually quite a bold move to kill the person you've made up to be the big villain okay who's the big villain now yeah. um, Kylo I guess yeah but that's not the who he is he's at, he's my favourite character out of the new series because he's actually got some complexity to him yeah. at least in the way he's played he's a more interesting version of Anakin yes uh, but anyway we can keep talking about Star Wars forever so great question it though might be time. yeah great very question, good question really, I will really. ca- ask it again next week and I'll elaborate <laughs> uh, Durlock Sergio is next a, what are your thoughts on the nominees for the Game of the Year awards? Control, Death Stranding, Resident Evil 2, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, Super Smash Bros, Ultimate, and The Art Worlds. Well, we've we've already talked about that um, quite a lot. Yeah, I think just, just briefly, though, he says, we can yeah. argue about Death Stranding, but overall I see a lack of innovation. I don't think that's... a that's, fair point. Uh, I think it's fair. Death Stranding is innovative. I think Control is reasonably in terms of the ability to control shit with your mind. It's not... I'd say it's innovative more than creative because creative is like brand new and innovative is building on what's already there. It does that really, really well. Resident Evil 2, it, I mean, that's innovated on what Resident Evil 2, the original, was. So I guess you can kind of say that, but in terms of actual gameplay, it's not that groundbreaking. Smash Bros. isn't either. Neither is The Outer Worlds. That's just a fucking solid RPG. And I've not played Sekiro, so I can't really comment on that. Mm-hmm. I guess there's kind of a lack of innovation. But I don't, no, I don't think that means any of those are bad uh, games. No, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't no. mean these games are bad to play. But um, As we say all the time about these reviews. What, what's new at the table? Yeah, yeah. It's just Death Stranding and uh, the, the, the rain that like makes <laughs> things old. I mean, that's new. If you can pick any game, what game would you like to see as Game of the Year? So I think Game, game of the Year is an interesting one because I can say this is the best game of the year, but it's not yeah. necessarily the game I enjoyed the most. I think my personal choice the game I enjoyed the most I don't even know well, Resident, Resident Evil 2 is my no. favourite not favourite but like my thing for game of the year for, for being the best game and being exactly what I wanted it to but then enjoyed the most I fucking love playing Devil May Cry because I had loads of nostalgia for it Days um, Gone uh, Days Gone was really really good loved the story of that playing Gears again after not having played Gears for years that was great to come back to and then the writing just fell apart <laughs> in yeah. the middle for me, the toss-up between Outer Worlds and Days Gone, and I think the Outer Worlds will just take it for me. Um, based on what I've played so far, I haven't got that far on it yet. Still, it's on ice for me at the moment. Uh, last part of the question, the very last question of the podcast. Uh, do you believe that the awards have any impact on the industry, i.e. if you give the award to Sekiro, you're going to see more games like that in the future? Um, probably. I-, I see more people like they'll look at award-winning games they'll literally type award-winning games into google yeah. and be like oh that's cool i'll buy that because it's got an award and they'll re-release everything with a new uh, cover or a game of the year edition type thing even yeah. if it doesn't come with dlc you can just put sekiro with game of the year winner uh, best action game winner or any of that uh, i reckon it probably will impact the future of any of those franchises but at the same time if they were going to have a future and they've made it this far to get game of the year anyway their future was probably already quite safe. Yeah. 
Um, so thanks for your questions. We've gone through a lot this week. It was a bit of an experiment and we've run a little bit over. Um, but thank you. We really appreciate um, all the input that you have on the Discord because uh, it really does help us make make content for you guys on the podcast. So um, uh, feel free to leave your questions and suggestions for topics uh, for next week's podcast in the appropriately, now appropriately titled um, Ask Podcast Questions um, channel on Discord. So that being said, it's time to move on now to the top two comments from this week, starting with the Triggered Fanboy Comments of the Week. And this week's Triggered Fanboy Comment was made on the podcast last week discussing Death Stranding, and it, I think it was aimed at you, Henry. Probably. So, 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 um, so batten down, dude. I just thought it was funny, okay? <laughs> so FNL Forever says, You are clueless! We don't need combat, add animals in there, in cutscenes and stuff to make it feel like an empty, boring world. Even if indie, it would not sell well, and press would, wouldn't give it tens. Unsubbed. You're a noob idiot. Get fired, scrub. <laughs> I have no idea what he... What? What video was that on? Was that on the, the podcast? podcast? Talking about Death Stranding, right? You are right? clueless. We don't need combat and animals. I assume he means and in there in there in cutscenes and stuff I don't know I the, don't. the fact that he unsubs is probably a good a good thing right you were a new idiot and get fired the fact that he wants you to lose your job over your opinion about a video game is exactly what's wrong with gaming <laughs> communities <laughs> right now what opinion did I have you are well, clueless we don't need combat and maybe, uh, maybe it was me that said it needs like I mean the open world is boring and needs animals or well I don't think any of us mentioned animals did we I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't recall. To be honest, it was a long discussion. It was like don't need half add half animals minutes. there in cutscenes. Add stuff to make it feel like a empty, boring world. But it is an empty world. But I mean, I'm not saying it's boring because that is kind of the point. Um, we don't need combat. If it, even if it don't was indie, it would not sell well, and press wouldn't give. to I don't. What, what side is he on? I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, it is very. Uh, it is very. Um, it's like he's picked vague. up his keyboard and just headbutted it. Yeah, that's that's just, generally uh, the case. But that you are the um, FNL forever. You are the triggered fanboy comment of the, of the week. Your uh, your p award will be in the mail, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. It's shaped like a giant middle finger turd. There you go. Do uh, you have a? Uh, I do. Where are we? Um, so this is one on the review roundup for Death Stranding with a little bit of my terrible gameplay from brian fitz i love the cutscenes every time he dies nice nice touch pgg um so i died a lot and i'm not even ashamed uh, like, I'm, I'm this got, was jedi fallen order yeah jedi fallen order which isn't a hard game it's a challenging game yeah uh yeah I'm, I'm not ashamed at all because i died once in the first recording <laughs> this was the second take because the first take um it didn't record the screen properly so yeah. oh let's do it again and the second recording i died like got... five times <laughs> It was and fun. like as it was happening, I was like, "Right, it's happened twice. I I'm going to get ahead of this. <laughs> I'm going to put some memes in." My favorite one was when I, I thought I parried him, but he didn't, and I made like a bitchy comment, like, "Oh well, I parried that, but whatever." And then I put in <laughs> Vader saying, "Perhaps you feel you're being treated unfairly." Yeah. That was not nice. that was funny. That's cool, awesome. Uh, on the same, v on the same video. And in the vein of someone being triggered, Matt Com Coombs says, Community is split. The title of the video was, Reviews split on the story and originality of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Reviews are split on the story and originality of Star Wars. Reviews are split on this specific thing and that specific thing. Okay? People are undecided about these two specific things. He says, Community is split. No, it's not. Reviews are pretty much all really positive. Clickbait video title. I'm reporting this video as being misleading. Re reported for what? something that is for no incorrect. Yeah, and there's, the f there's, all, there's a few comments the which which say that like, oh, the reviews aren't split. Was like, well, actually, I'm um, actually, I'm um, actually. That's not what the title says. <laughs> is the split about the story? They're not sure about the story. Split. They don't know whether the story is good or bad, and they split about the originality. They're not sure whether it's good or bad. That it's it, whether it's original or not. That. It's simple. What was the Read other one? It, it was the Death Stranding one where it was reviewers are split, and that was because they com 
provided conflicting opinions yeah. in their in, in their own individual thing. Yeah. They just see a word and then their brain just switches off and it's like, uh, you said it's split, you said the reason they're not split actually. Yeah. Uh, they're actually very positive. Because I like this game and I am fucking yeah. triggered. That's essentially what they're saying, right? Um, so I've got one here which again is about the podcast where we talked about Death Stranding. From Gamer Taboo, I was kind of intrigued about Death Stranding, but you just sold me on it. Done deal, downloading now. And I like I like seeing that because it makes me feel like we've actually had an impact on someone's uh, gaming experience. And because yeah. there was another person who said, "Oh, cool, I'm I'm gonna buy Death Stranding now. Thanks for explaining it." Type thing. Yeah. And I like seeing this both ways. Like if they say, "Oh no, that that doesn't sound like the game for me. I won't be buying it based on what you've said." Like it feels like we're actually contributing, right? Yeah, and giving information, and they're you're receiving it. You're not just. Act like you know going in one ear and out the other next up Felipe Carvalho says these review of reviews you've been doing are great fun to hear and save us a lots of time and look at that it's something new and fun and then uh, M Gbus follows back you've just reviewed a review of reviews Revception <laughs> I like that <laughs> yeah Revception so a little bit of um, I think people are starting to warm to the review of review the re- review of reviews because it's essentially what we do um, anyway when we're trying to um, sum up a game uh, as we go through all the reviews and, and uh, internally as an like, individual trying to see whether it's good or not and the fact we've just thrown them into a um, video format I think you know people are starting to connect with it hopefully people appreciate it just as much as Philippe Carvalho does thanks for the feedback dude uh, I haven't got any more ready okay next up a season one says thank you both for being so awesome my shit jobs definitely made more bearable listen to the podcast and your content keep up the pretty good work thank you for the for the support and the encouragement because you know we get a lot of pos- uh, negative comments that we do read out a lot of the time um, we don't read out enough of these positive ones and it's it's very heartening to know that there are people out there who do appreciate what we do and you know it makes a difference whether it, whether it is just relieving the boredom or tedium of, of working a uh, long shift or whatever hopefully we can we can um, entertain people enough and um, so that they appreciate it do you have one? yeah I've got another one from the review roundup on Jedi Fallen Order and I like this one uh, James DeGriz character animation makes him look like he's got Jedi Aurea <laughs> which I thought was great. Day, yeah. It's a sick pun, which is awesome. But also, I have thought his running animation does does kind of look odd. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's that the animator making odd decisions, or that's the way uh, the actor Cameron Monaghan mocapped it. He's just it's got bad form. Yeah. <laughs> bad form. Okay, the next comment comes from Duncan and says, "Wait, you can't wait. So you can't justify the upfront cost of a PC, but you sat there with a MacBook." You could get oh, a gaming we, PC or laptop for much less than a MacBook. Yes, Henry, you sat there with a PC that's been provided to you for your work, but it's given to you so you can use. You haven't paid for any I yourself. Don't own this. You're sitting there in front of it, and you can't justify spending a thousand pounds plus on a gaming PC. You fucking idiot! Come on, Henry. Is that what you're saying? Sorry. <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, there's nothing more I can that, say. That belong- that's a PGG. Um, that's the you know. You can edit on that thing. You can capture audio on that thing. It works for business, for work purposes. It doesn't. It's. It's. Ne- it was never for gaming. People say that all the time. Sitting there, look at these noobs in front of it, playing with uh, on their Apple devices. Uh, new PC master race for the win. Like, what, what do you expect? <laughs> if we didn't have this, you wouldn't make a comment. Like, but we could still just like not have a piece of, what would you expect to have a huge PC system here with a, the monitor there and all this fucking clobber it would it would block our handsome faces yeah true do you have one I was looking for one because I did see it earlier but I can't seem to find it I've got an um actually of the week an um actually of I've the got week an, um actually of the week and it comes from Rebel One and he says um actually solid as a slab of carbonite that's a metaphor lads not a pun and oh yeah and <laughs> funnily enough Sir, Cyrus Vader jumps in with a saving um actually of his own to um actually the original um actually uh okay and he says actually he actually uses that word yeah. actually actually it's a simile <laughs> Fuck yeah I yeah. love it they're um actually each other in the comments now uh it's it's amazing it's amazing. Um, actually, it's a metaphor. No, um, actually, it's a simile. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, I'll, I'm actually him because similes are 
uh, types of metaphors. You don't get taught that in <laughs> primary school. They're just like, a metaphor is and a simile as. But yeah, fucking so... We, we, we don't just script those bits. There's just chit-chat. And yeah, I fucking said a pun. All right, cool. If that's the worst thing I do all day, I am fine with living with that. We're fine with that. We're like, absolutely seriously. fine with that. Do you have any more comments? <laughs> what, um, this, it, this is an easy joke to make, but it was in our Activision the other day where uh, we said a bit about... Bobby Kotick saying that someone said Bobby Kotick is going to fuck us but what the guy was actually saying was focus but in a thick French accent so we we kept saying it and laughing about it and then obviously someone called 71 just comments focus guys focus focus focus, guys (laughs) so I just thought that was quite an easy one awesome uh, I think that is about it for me <clears throat> for the comments Have yeah. you, are you done? yeah I think I'm done and we're just on time so th- uh, just to wrap this thing up thanks for watching this week leave your feedback on the new kind of structure of the podcast this week let, let us know your thoughts on the uh, the kind of the summary of news articles from the week which we started with and then the discussion topics to us by our community as well as the questions and then the um you best youtube comments how did we fit all that in henry there's i mean it's impo- it's impossible with but we lot, managed it with a lot of under lube. two hours as well <laughs> <laughs> good luck editing this one henry that's all i'll yeah, say right. um so thanks everyone we will see you again in the next podcast or the next video whenever you see us until then bye for now <laughs> <laughs>